What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Our Game of Fire podcast. Tonight, we are here with Sinotalk. Sinotalk uh, is a China-focused independent analyst, but I'm going to let him tell you guys a little bit about himself, uh, his background, how he got started, um, independent journalism, all that. So, Sino, thank you for coming on with us tonight. Um, as you guys can see, um, Sino uh, would appreciate not being shown, so we're going to respect that and keep his screen blank. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this will remain a video episode. So, but Sino, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself, man. Hey everyone, my name is Sinotalk. As Brandon said, I'm a China-focused independent analyst, but I also can touch upon various other aspects and topics of the East Asia uh, region, such as India, North Korea, the Pacific Islands, etc. A little bit about myself. Well, I guess it's where I began, uh, where my interest actually budded or fruited. Um, I was in the Marine Corps for five years as an intel analyst. And the first two years, I was actually stationed on Okinawa, where I actually got to see and notice the importance of China, and not only then, but also now and in the future. And so that would kind of led me to focus a lot of my uh, research and analysis on China, but other uh, East Asia topics. That's awesome. Um, so your your experience in essentially in the Marine Corps as an intel analyst, what would you say um, it was with your leadership as far as uh, discussing China and them being an upcoming threat? I think it would be a mixed bag of one, some understood while others didn't see it. Mm -hmm. They thought that, you know, the low intensity conflicts in the Middle East and Afghanistan would be the bread and butter of the Marine Corps instead of China because they didn't see the threat. They didn't really see uh -huh. like the reason why we should focus on China. Yeah. And yeah, so it was kind of weird because, you know, even whenever I tried to explain to them, you know, it's, this is, it's a threat. They, they said this, like, even in right. like, uh, even in like their state media, exactly. Even in their state media, they, they said like, yeah, we, we want to, uh, we want to become, uh plan. Exactly. And so and even then, like they said, oh, well, that's just propaganda. You can't really just believe it. I'm like, there's a there's a fine line between propaganda and like what they believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I mean, like if we're going to use the same terminology or the same uh, uh, analogy, you know, the Nazis said, oh, well, we want to kill. We want to, you know, annihilate all the Jews. And at the right. time, people thought it was propaganda until, you know, we seen the camps. Right. That's a yeah, good, so, good analogy. Yeah, so it was very interesting. And even then, like, it was very interesting as I sat down and thought about exactly the demographics of who said this. Mm -hmm. it, it was always, like, two major groups. It was one in the officer corps, it was, like, the majors of captains, like, half and half, where they said that, hey, Afghanistan is always going to be or places like Afghanistan will always be the Marine Corps' focus. China's not so much. Even mm -hmm. then, we can still win if we wanted to. We'll beat them. We'll beat them easily. And, you know, as I explained to them, you know, it's it's not really the case. They're becoming a better force. They're actually training. They actually are taking, actually learning from right. and analyzing, you know, past wars. And then not only that, but, um, you know, understanding the United States and the West and Western military's faults and try to build upon those. Mm -hmm. And then the other demographic within the enlisted side was the staff and CO Corps and, you know, this the E6s, staff sergeants and above, where right. they said they don't really see the point. Um, China's not a threat. They, you know, whenever we would debate about this, they would ultimately use their rank and say, like, I'm a staff sergeant. Mm -hmm. You're a corporal or a lance corporal. I know better. Right. And right. I, like, I sat hard. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've definitely been there before. I've been told just essentially by you know authority of rank that I'm right, you're wrong, you know, despite the facts. And uh, it's interesting you say that because I've had similar conversations even recently with uh, leaders in my unit and other units about the upcoming threat uh, with China. And just some of the things that have been said to me, you know, that this will never be 
uh, a hot war or this will never be a boots on the ground war or whatever. Um, you know, you, you can think that all you want. Um, if it never happens, then good, right? As long as America uh, rights its ship. Um, but, you know, to, to think that this would be an all online war, a cyber war, essentially, all the way through to me is a pretty crazy thought. Um, because, you know, it, it says to me that this person doesn't understand the way the internet works. Uh, because all this stuff needs to be able to connect to something, data links, all this stuff. And once that goes away, it's just, you know, you and me. And that's it, you know, boots on the ground. And uh, look at look at what happened in the Ukraine with Russia. They went right back to trench warfare, you know, despite all the, the technology we have available, this supposed Russian hypersonic missile, the Kinzel, you know, all this stuff that uh, they, they have is more technologically advanced than we were in World War One, And here we are back in they're, they're in trench warfare. So um, it somehow just seems to go right back to mud, blood and grinding it out. You know, so, um, but it, that is, it is pretty wild. I'd say, you know, and I was, I'm not in the Marine Corps, I'm in the Air Force. And uh, we, we definitely have spent a lot more time focusing on China now um, in a lot of different ways. So that's good. It's nice to see, although uh, sometimes it feels a, a little too late. Um, but we'll see. You know, the United States is a pretty resilient country. Um, but honestly, that's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to have you on here. You know, checking out your Substack, um, the your the Instagram page you run, and some of the guys that you the crowd that you run in, you guys have a lot of really great things to say, and a lot of people need to hear what you guys talk about and understand the dynamic. And it's funny too because yesterday Zach and I were on the phone. And he, he had a map up and he was like looking at all this stuff, like how close like Okinawa is to Taiwan, to Taiwan, you know, to mainland China and Guam and all this. And he was like, holy shit. You know, we were talking about um, different weapon systems, you know, the DF-21, DF-17 and uh, aircraft carriers. And I think for the first time, Zach even had himself a little bit of a coming to Jesus moment mm -hmm. about how how serious it is and how close everything is in that area, you know? Yeah, so a lot of people don't really understand that is the fact that mm -hmm. Okinawa is probably around 200 or so miles away or nautical miles away from um, uh, Taiwan. Not only that, but I mean, if you're going to really talk, focus upon the Ryukyu Islands, Yuguni Island is only, it's less than like 100 mm -hmm. or so kilometers away. I mean, you could see right. Taiwan, the western swords of Taiwan and the mountain ranges on a, a yeah. clear day. And so That's to nuts. say that, yeah, I mean, to say that they don't really see, to say that geography doesn't matter in the Pacific because it's a, it's an ocean and it's, there's islands, yeah. we can, we can island hop. That screams in the face of past experiences in, of the U.S. military, especially during World War II. Mm -hmm. In fact, because, you know, island hopping campaign demanded them understanding geography, understanding the islands, which islands is more are more important, which ones get just literally lither on the vine, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason why geog geography plays such an important role, even if it is water, <laughs> ocean. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And we looked up some of the ranges on like these missiles that we were just talking about, you know, the the F-21 is an anti-aircraft carrier ballistic missile, literally designed to take out United States aircraft carriers. And the range on it means that, you know, it can hit from pretty far out. Now, I know we're going to have a conversation about, like, likelihood of hitting moving targets, carrier strike groups and defense and stuff like that. But on paper, just on the surface, like, understanding the arena for combat potentially is extremely important. And um, being able to pick your battlefield, so to speak, and demand the terms of which you're going to meet your enemy on the field. All of that, like you said, geography has to be taken into account. Positioning, what is more advantageous strategically, all of that stuff. Um, which, again, like I said, I'm really, really glad that you're on here to talk to us about. So um, I appreciate it, man. No, you're welcome, Dan. I, yeah, I mean, I really appreciate you and you and Zach reaching out to me so we can actually discuss this because it seems like a lot of the topics we're going to be talking about are very important, but not many people are talking about them. Mm -hmm. They get glossed over. Yeah. So when you were 
in the Marine Corps, you don't have to tell us the exact time frame unless you don't, unless you want to. Um, I'm assuming you're, you're older. Um, so your five years, was that like the early 2000s, late 2000s? When was that? Like who was George Bush president? Was Obama president? Like who was, what time frame were we talking about? I would say I served majority in the Obama era in which okay. um, I don't know how political we can get into this podcast, but as political as you want. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, his administration kind of dropped the ball regarding China. And I, I'm saying this as a, as a political as possible because, you know, most people will say, Oh, because you know, he's a Democrat. And also other people are like, oh, well, he's, you know, not Republican. He's, you know, liberal, progressive. It's like, no, sure. he's just dropped the ball. Just like right. George W. Bush did. And the reason why he dropped the ball, and I will give this credit to Obama for realizing that this is the mm -hmm. fact that, or realizing the error of this, is the fact that we thought for the longest time that China, we could make China change. We can guide, we can guide its rise to power, if you will, as a, as a power and do, you know, economics, you know, if we give them economic capitalism, they'll eventually get democracy, but as Simmons, as Simmons square shown, not so much. Yeah. And, but that not only, they not only decrease, um, they're not only, um, glossed over, but it took them another 10 or uh, 20 or so years before they realized that China is, really not our friend <laughs> it's right. something else yeah the main reason why i brought it up is because obama is coined for starting like the asia pivot where like during the obama administration his his later years not early on so like his second term exactly he started his like hey we should the war in afghanistan's ending the war in iraq is like ending the war on terror is ending and he was starting his like Asia pivot. Like we need to start worrying about China, all this type of stuff. So I was curious if maybe, because at least in the Air Force today, uh, we usually don't learn about China being a threat or anything until NC until NCOA. So you are a like a tech sergeant, uh, or just recently put on tech sergeant, which is E six, and you have a whole course about it. They make you write papers about it, study about it, learn about it. Most of the people in my class didn't even know about the the Belt Road Initiative. Um, they didn't know that China's like building islands in the Pacific. They didn't know about the nine dash line. And to me, I was like, what? Like you are NCOs in the air force. You don't know about this. And I, I do praise the air force for trying to teach them, like forcing it upon them, I guess. So they know when they become leaders, but I was just curious if maybe the, the leaders you were talking about, so like the captains and majors, they probably weren't too far into the, I guess the overall scope, probably more like colonels and generals who probably knew most about China being a threat. And it just didn't get filtered down because it wasn't needed. But for your like upper echelon of enlisted, like your senior NCOs, do you think they were maybe a year like a Lance Corporal or a Corporal or Pratt First Class, whatever, talking to him saying, hey, this is important. Do you think maybe they were lowering you down so you didn't worry about it while they were actually worrying about it? Does that make sense? Like they were because they knew about it, but they were like, hey, like stay in your lane. Focus Don't worry your about job. it. Yeah. Until you get to like Sergeant Staff Sergeant. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I do agree to that in some, in some aspects, but then also there's, because they, they had that, you know, I've noticed in other units, not so much as mine, that they were still piped information or keep it away from, keep it to themselves or within certain groups of individuals. But mm -hmm. I lucked out of being amongst, you know, captains and majors who also saw that and staff sergeant and, and gunnies and you know and sergeants who saw the threat that china posed not only militarily but economically diplomatically things this is that and so I, that's why i consider myself lucky being able to be with them who and be under their tutelage if you will or mentorship to so they can blossom me or you know school mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and one of the bigger things about it is I think it's just because we were in Afghanistan since 2001, Iraq in 2003, and various other places in the North, uh, in the Shahil, North Africa, and Middle East, Horn of Africa. And we've been there for so long that mm -hmm. there may have been some bias in, in the fact that th these are always going to be our wars. No one's going to get into a conventional fight anymore. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, 
I kind of view it as like Francis Fuqua's, Fuqua Maya's, um, um, the end of history, mm -hmm. which I, I don't believe in what he, the majority of the book. And the fact that he said like, you, the United States is a unipolar power and right. you know, within, and that's like the only time in history that that ever happened, which, you know, that's wrong. Even in, you know, during, uh, Great Britain, the Pax Britannica, do you have mm -hmm. these other powers in which, uh, try to change the balance of power to definitely make, uh, exactly to make, uh, to less, to make, uh, Britain less powerful. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm great. Yeah. So it's one of those things in which I kind of see it both ways. And the fact that, you know, stay in your lane, but then also the bias. And the fact that we're always going to be fighting this war because we will, because we've always have. I think the other thing, too, is the, the military in general is so slow to pivot to something else than what they're focusing on and have been focusing on. That having conversations about other areas is detracting in their mind from training for you know, modern uh, operations, military operations in urban terrain or whatever, you know, like, oh, we're focused on the Middle East or Southwest Asia or whatever. So let's not talk about this right now, because it seems to be the military is very focused on one thing and one thing only. So that like unilateral thinking, um, talking about that kind of jumps into, you know, where I really like to start this thread is how the U.S. got here. You know, everybody understands that the United States has been at war and has, you know, for, for 20 plus years, the longest war in U.S. history. Uh, there's lots to be said about it in a lot of different ways, um, a lot of different thoughts and opinions that people have. But other than uh, the, the very obvious 20 plus years of war, where did the world's largest military industrial complex drop the ball? I think it's the, U the United States losing its ability to do long-term or future analysis because as mm -hmm. Peter Zahan actually pointed out in the Joe Rogan podcast that the United States lost a lot of that forward thinking in the years immediately after 9-11 because we were so focused, as you said, Brandon, we were so focused mm -hmm. upon the threat of Islamic terrorism, Al-Qaeda, uh, Islamic State, that we didn't really see the point of having or needing that future analysis to where, hey, you know, we see China as a threat in 2045, so we just need to start planning on producing X number of destroyers. Maybe we need a mm -hmm. new defense system, uh, uh, anti-ballistic uh, air, uh, ballistic missile system. We need to redo the entire doctrine of the Marine Corps so they can fit into this, etc. Right. And while I do agree with Zahan that, you know, the United States is getting that capability back from my perspective it's at least eight years too late i agree maybe even 10 maybe even 10 right because definitely yeah because we can't just build that um build that um we can't build it back up overnight like a lot of people mm -hmm. think oh what's this future analysis like looking at a crystal ball like not really like when you're trying to do future analysis, you have to take in the account of a lot of stuff like economics, uh, military, domestic political situation, and project all those out mm -hmm. to see what will, uh, what could happen or what will happen. And it takes a really good analyst to do that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it's interesting you bring that up about um, losing focus because there's another book. I don't know. You may have read it. So, you know, um, it's called Ghost Wars by a guy named Steve Cole. Um, in it, he discusses that when obviously the United States ran a lot of interference against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan for a long time. Um, and were given out weapons and, you know, uh, those anti-aircraft missiles that they, they were giving out the name, the type of them, uh, escapes my mind right now. But after that was over and the Soviet Union left Afghanistan, the United States said, okay, cool. Deuces, we're out of here. All these warlords, you know, we don't need you anymore. All this stuff that, you know, we promised you guys, um, about helping you rebuild. We're really not going to focus on. And, they lost all these people that spoke the dialects of the region. They lost all these people that had um, the intel and understood the traditions and customs of the region. And when they needed it, 
and they needed it immediately. They only had two people that spoke, I want to say Pashto, and the maps that they had of Afghanistan sitting in like the foreign field office uh, were from like 1970s. And, uh, you know, and it's, so it just goes to show you, it seems to be a thing where, you know, we say, okay, this is done. We don't need to focus or have anything, you know, nobody keeping up even in the background. And, um, but this time it seems it's, it's really bitten us in the ass because we are playing catch up in a lot of different ways. And it does seem like, you know, the Chinese have outpaced, well, they definitely have outpaced us in a lot of different ways, but almost seemingly um, to the point where we cannot catch up unless something happens to them and they stop. So, no, I I agree with that, man. And it's the fact that I think it's a combination of us not really caring, but then also with the fact that you have to understand um, throughout the years at the State Department, there's been purges of China experts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The most significant was the McCarthy era, where every, he pretty much right. did a fantastic job. If you're looking at it from the Chinese viewpoint of destroying any. Any people who've been to China are obviously a red communist. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be here. Let's kick them out. And, right. you know, that led to a lot, to a massive brain drain within China or within the State Department, but not only the State Department, but also the Defense Department as well. Uh -huh. And you kind of see that again, in a way, whenever Henry Kissinger wanted to negotiate with China, he literally sidestepped all the budding, uh, the new generation of China watchers and China analysts within the State Department. He said, I don't mm -hmm. need y'all. I understand this country and look at what, look at what we got back. Look how we, look at where that got us in terms of mm -hmm. not only with China, but then also with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, um, especially the verbiage surrounding like the three communiques, the Shanghai communique, things this is that, because um, I don't know if you really read the news or, or read the news whenever, whenever Blinken, was in China the last time. Mm -hmm. um, there was a reason why he highlighted those those communiques. Matter of fact, when everyone, every State Department administration highlights that, is because the Chinese focus so much on those communiques and things as that, so that hey, you agree to this, like you you can't go back on your word. It's I know it's like it's like a catch twenty two because China. You know, Can essentially you... takes uh, any agreements that they find relevant to them or advantageous to them as writ of law and totally disregarding others that do not like it. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on what those communiques actually are for people who are listening and may not know? Yeah, so the communiques, so the three communiques are a series of speeches or statements made by both the Chinese and the United States. Um, right before or a little bit after the United States or China opened up to the United States or the United States established relations. Mm -hmm. And in it, they said that China, essentially the bread and butter of these communications is that Taiwan, there is only one China and it's between Taiwan and United and, and Taiwan. It's only be, and it's between Taiwan and China to decide what that looks like. So they kind so in a weird way, Kissinger sidestepped the issue while saying that, "Hey, we we understand there's one China, but and we're not going to get involved, or at least overtly, mm -hmm. and because that's a domestic issue, that's an internal issue between not only you, China, but also Taiwan. Which, right. at my viewpoint, he got it right in the fact that he did recognize that it was a domestic issue." But then also the, he got it wrong because of the fact that he didn't really, he also recognized that it's a domestic issue or in the fact that that kind of gives China more lead way in the, uh, to say, butt out of our business. Mm -hmm. please. I think I just want to say real quick too, that I've had, I've heard from a lot of people when we talk about this, um, they don't understand why there's a rift between China and Taiwan. Um, they don't understand that during the, the communist revolution, basically the losing side went to Taiwan um, and established a, a different nation, so to speak. Um, is there anything about that that uh, you know, maybe I just gave a very uh, top-down overview of it, but 
that I didn't say out loud generally that um, other people should know? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people should know is that the reason why Taiwan or the KMT actually fled to Taiwan is because they lost, mm -hmm. they essentially lost the civil war in 1949. Right. Like they ended or they completely uh, uh, fled the, evacuated the, the mainland. I want to say a month or so after they, after Mao declared the PRC as mm -hmm. a country. And so well, yes, there was a there was that remnant of the nationalist government within Taiwan that says you know that may pretty much ruled as an independent entity, uh, de facto, a de facto mm -hmm. independent entity. It kind of evolved, or the rift kind of evolved over the years between you know Taiwan and China mm -hmm. because of how because of the pathways they took. You have to understand the Taiwanese or the KMT was based upon a Leninist Marxist system. Mm -hmm. So in a weird way, they were communist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize Definitely. this. Right. Yeah. It, even to this day, if you were to go on the, the Ministry of Defense website, you could still see a section that says political warfare mm -hmm. department. And so it's one of those things in which. Interesting. Yeah. They, they try to say that they're not, they try to hide that, but at the same time, it's like you, the evidence is right there. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the pathway divulged in the eighties, whenever change guy six, a son or grandson, I say, mm -hmm. actually moved towards in the or democracy, adding democracy or moving towards democracy. Mm -hmm. Because before that, Taiwan and China was essentially the same. Uh, autocratic government ruled by one person who had who held the majority of the power but then in the 80s kind of seen that change in taiwan where you know he said we need to democratize we're opening you know we're beginning to open up our economy and so that's where you've seen this road to democracy leading up to the first election in taiwan in mm. the mid 90s and then conversely with that you have CCP dominated or Chinese Communist Party dominated China, where not so much. They've maintained that one party rule will aid the Chinese people, will show will prosper, will make them prosperous. The mm -hmm. revolution will make you pro prosperous, as Mao would say. Um, and that failed during the Maoist era. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mao killed at least 80 million. People That's wild between yeah between like 1949 to until he died in 1976 I believe mm -hmm. he was responsible for that many for millions of deaths because of his outrageous policies and not only that but the Cultural Revolution and mm -hmm. him calling everyone that he can Borgeries in right. his state so and then not only that but. You've seen China beginning to bring in, a, you know, become a capitalist economy. And then you've seen them like, okay, we can, we can allow some democracy in, you know, we, we can let you vote at the village level, see if that works out. But ultimately mm -hmm. the power will be with us because we can't let your Chinese, you know, rule yourselves because, you know, it, it will go crazy. Look at the warlord era, look at the past era where, yeah. you know, chaos reigned. Right. And so that's kind of leads me to another point to where the rift lies in the fact that that whole um, argument on the C that the CCP has, Taiwan kind of nullifies it because mm -hmm. Taiwan is a, is a functioning democracy. It, yes, the elections can get out of hand, but I encourage you or I encourage you to look at any other elections within the Asia Pacific region and compare the two. They're pretty right. much the same in terms of, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, in terms of um, volume and just intensity. Mm -hmm. And so you see this driving democracy that flies in the face of Taiwan or it flies in the face of China. And not only that, but just the fact that it kind of a nationalist aspect of it because they mm -hmm. want, because they feel as if, like acquiring, reacquiring Taiwan or reunifying, quote unquote, Taiwan, which 
a fun fact, Taiwan was really never unified with China, uh, China. Mm -hmm. but unification reunification is a thing that they like to say or the CCP likes to say because it fits their narrative, it fits their propaganda. Mm -hmm. But they've kind of view it as like writing the final writing of the historical wrong of the mm -hmm. hundred years of humiliation in which mm -hmm. Taiwan uh, was taken by the Japanese in 1895. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that you did a really good out, you really good job outlining a lot of the history that goes into this because I think a lot of people seem to just think that the tension with China and everything that China has been aiming to do uh, is only coming from a place that's maybe a couple decades old since America lost focus. Um, you know, you, you're talking about um, earlier, like the, the Qing Dynasty, Shanghai Shek, um, the hundred years of um, uh, embarrassment or whatever it's. Um, called a hundred years of shame and uh this has some serious roots because the chinese see themselves as the oldest culture on earth and that they are the center of the earth and that all of this that goes on on the earth is eventually going to be china again or as china sees it and so this isn't just um a new political aim that maybe xi jinping or his you know the, the former chairman the last couple of chairmen have decided is going to happen. This is something that is, is of historical significance. They're changing their political landscape, changing the landscape on, um, you know, the, the things that people are allowed to read and the history that they learn. Uh, you know, I, I was going to ask you when you brought up Mao, I wonder how many Chinese citizens actually know about Mao and how many people died during the cultural revolution, because I feel like the number is probably pretty low. You'd be surprised, actually. Um, really? Yeah. Um, a lot of people know a lot of people died, but at the same time, mm -hmm. they know not to talk about it, obviously, mm -hmm. um, for uh, for fear of being imprisoned or being told right. not, don't say that, um, or right. losing their accounts or losing their social media accounts. Right. Um, it's interesting because you kind of see it. You kind of, if you break it up by demographic, you kind of see it's, a, it's an increase. So mm -hmm. maybe around 45, maybe the elderly, they would, they know how many people died, but they also won't talk about it because one, they still have the love of communism, love of Maoism, like the, like the love of that lost mm -hmm. age, even though it brought so much harm and despair to them. Mm -hmm. They still liked it because, you know, Mao gave us our respect back or, you know, our, freedom if you will back sure and then next to that is the you know tenement square uh, uh tenement square generation in which people you know they opened they had this opening up people understood that maybe the malice era wasn't the best era we had mm -hmm. and they kind of opened the door and like understanding mal did these horrible things and that's the reason why Deng xiaoping said that you know while uh during one of the party congress mao did some good stuff but and, but he also did some horrible stuff as well he wasn't always right and so so they understood but then now that you have but then it goes down to like the maybe the 30s the 20s um my age where they were able to go to college in the united states or in other western countries they were able to go and visit um, Taiwan. They were able to go visit um, and stay the, and stay in uh, and have a you know have a semester in California or Texas or Arizona or whatever have you. Mm -hmm. And they finally understood that we did some horrible stuff. <laughs> Mal did some horrible stuff because they they, they researched this. Right. And you kind of see that you kind of see that whenever, especially whenever I was I would talk to these talk to some of the students, hmm. and I would I would ask them, hey, I mean, I would get their trust, of course. Like I would I wouldn't like point blank ask them, uh, especially if they're like around other Chinese people because sure um, surveillance is intense. You, well, not defensive, but just the mere fact that it's. The whole notion that Chinese Communist Party and their operatives are on, you know, is mm -hmm. on U.S. campus campuses, or college campuses, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. right on the bat. Is right on the bat, and 
you kind scary. of yeah it, it is it's it's one of those it's a very interesting aspect that's not really many people are still talking about even though they kind of hinted at it in 2018 or 19 mm -hmm. especially here in texas but yeah so they would they wouldn't be defensive they would just say oh well i, I don't want to talk about that if they're in front of if they're around chinese people but if you get them alone and if they trust you enough not to like talk to anyone else or anyone anything anything else or anyone else like that mm -hmm. in that matter at least repeat what he said then they'll be open about it like yeah i, I looked on a vpn use a vpn yeah. to find like information about mal and i didn't know about this i you right. know i knew or i knew like mal did some horrible things but i didn't know he caused a great leap for famine you know mm. i didn't know like i didn't know all these things in which you see that in which you see that in and then being frank about it and it kind of eye-opening because you think that oh well they believe propaganda you know mm -hmm. they were bombarded with propaganda but here's the thing with propaganda if you're always bombarded with it right you just you, you're just gonna ignore it exactly you're just gonna ignore it or just uh, like read it, it like oh, okay exactly I, I remember seeing a like a study they did on billboards on u.s highways it takes like eight passes i think before the billboard becomes part of the background where your brain doesn't actually pick it up anymore. So you, you know, you'll see, Oh, casino, casino, casino. And eventually you won't even notice that it's there until it changes. Um, so it's, and it's funny too, you say that that propaganda eventually becomes the background um, in the United States, even now in some of the way our MSM operates is the propaganda and the misinformation is all over the place. And it's become so commonplace that we, almost don't even react to it anymore because we just expect it. Well, it even happens with our like big disaster type pieces too. Like whenever True. there's like an active shooter, like I, I remember right. like 10, 15 years right. ago, an active shooter happened. Everyone's like, Oh my God. And it's like news forever. Oh, and now it's like just a sentence on like a quick thing because you're just yep. expecting there to be active shooters. You're like, Oh yeah, whatever. It's a normal thing. It just happens here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no, I agree with that. It's one of those things in which the Chinese are expecting it. You do see some, you do see some reaction to certain topics, such as you know if it involves nationalism or Taiwan, mm -hmm. or it's or at least um, certain aspects of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's just phrased into the background. Definitely. So, so before we get kind of too into too far into like how China could maybe conduct this war or what it would look like going to war with China um, or having a conflict with them. I kind of want to just start out with a, with a pretty broad question. Um, does anyone care about Taiwan? Like realistically, does anyone care? And why, why would the U S get so involved in this? If it's just a small Island in the middle Good of the question. Pacific, like what's, what's the U S's end game or why should they care? Why should the U S people care? And why is it such a pivotal point in potential human history? I think more people should care than what they do right now, at least pay more actual substantive service than the lip service that they do. Mm -hmm. Because for economic, diplomatic, uh, military things, this is that. And, you know, I. I would pose I would pose to these that are the same people who are like don't really see the importance of Taiwan. Okay, do you want to pay three to four times the cost of everyday products? To include yeah. and I'm, I'm not even talking about like you know cell phones or you know uh, other electronics in general. I'm talking mm -hmm. about in general, like Car I'm computers. talking about every, exactly because that will happen if Taiwan if China would invade. Mm -hmm. Because it will cause the economy to crash so badly that that we may have to focus upon fixing our economy before even trying to intervene in China, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Taiwan. Not only that, but just economically, and we kind of are getting away from this. Is that we have so much? We're overly dependent upon China. Mm -hmm. We're getting away from it, but we still are dependent upon them in certain areas. 
So what? any so any conflict would uh, would meh, uh, would disrupt those supply chains that still exist. Yeah, but what I was so with the supply chain issues, right? So obviously, if a comic broke out, it's going to be like a whole bunch of like ramifications fell throughout the economy and consumers and all type of stuff. But with like the Vietnam War, the American public wasn't behind it, so it eventually fizzled out. Even though like the U.S. was winning. It fizzled out and ended because the American public wasn't behind it. And I, I, I guess if if China can, in a way, explain or prove or show to, I guess, enough Americans, like citizens, that, hey, if you just give us Taiwan and don't don't support your government in trying to stop us or whatever, then we'll keep prices low. And I, I guess, is the American people, like, are they ready to potentially give up their current Kush lifestyle for the people of Taiwan or for even the cause to stop China? Or are we potentially so enveloped in our current lifestyles that we'll turn the other way because it's not on our doorstep and I still get my iPhone. I still get my whatever, you know, you know, you know what I mean here? Yeah, no, you actually make a good point. And that kind of leads me to my other uh, other point is the fact that, you know, the United States, any conflict within the United States or between the United States and China, I should say, would involve first strikes against you American forces. Mm-hmm. So what that would mean when we see strikes against, uh, we see strikes against American bases in Okinawa and mainland Japan, of course. You, it just brings you, Japan in. <laughs> exactly. Well, Guam. Yeah, exactly. It brings Japan in. Yeah. But not only that, but just strikes against Guam. And then now you know, uh, China's indicating that Thai, uh, Australia will be hit. So you have this, so you have this snowballing effect in which if you strike one of us, you're going to be fighting more than the United States. But then also with the fact that you have to look at Pearl Harbor, uh, the political environment after, uh, before that, before the attack. Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't really see the point of us getting involved in either theater, even though uh, even though Japan, Imperial Japan, was doing a lot of forensic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did do some economic embargoes, things like that, that crippled the economy, like what's going on now. Mm -hmm. But the main difference was the main difference was Japan was uh, was desperate enough to strike Pearl Harbor so they can set the conditions for a. Coming to battle, which mm-hmm. was midway, which they were defeated. Yeah. But that was also a time and so, where, like, the U.S. government could, in a way, control the narrative of news, right? I feel like in, very, in, in, they could kind of convince the American public that what we're doing is still good and that we're, we're, we're moving forward. I'm not saying that, like, the war wouldn't happen outright or that it wouldn't begin. But, like, I, I guess my overall question, Sino, is. What's the buy-in to convince the American public to be supportive of stopping China for for like today and for like the next 15, 20, 30 years? Does that... Yeah, no, no, it, it does. And I think the buy-in, again, going back to economic as well, but then also a lot of people don't understand is Taiwan is a democracy like us. Mm-hmm. Taiwan is a democracy like, you know, like Australia, Japan. Things as that. So, if we were to fail to go out to defend them, then not only our allies within the region would say, "Like, why do we have a alliance with you if you're not going to help us?" But then also in Europe as well, but then also South America. Mm-hmm. So you will see this fracturing of you will see this continued fracturing of of, of these regions to multipolar domains, if you will. Mm-hmm. So in South America or Latin America, it could probably be between, it could probably be between Mexico and Brazil and Africa. It could be South Africa dominated at least some areas. Then you have some others that may be uh, dominated by Egypt, potentially. Maybe Nigeria, if they ever get the uh, domestic house in order. Mm-hmm. And in Europe, it'd be a, it would be a mix of either EU or Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. Because Eastern Europe would go their own way if that was the case. 
mm-hmm. and the Middle East would be potentially Saudi Arabia and Israel and Iran, a matchup between them three countries and also Turkey. But specifically going back, the buy-in would be, you know, the American people. Would you want to live in a ward where the United, where the United States is a secondary country to China? in which they will try to impose exactly they would like to impose a lot of their stuff that's that's the thing i worry about so like brandon shakes his head no i would Mm -hmm. shake my head no i assume Sino, you would shake your head no right my dad would shake his head no all type of stuff but people in my family i know where you're going with this whatever who cares who cares it doesn't i still wake up i still can continue on my lifestyle it doesn't matter to me like on an individual level and I, I'm so worried I would, that most of Americans today just would not care. They don't have the preservation of democracy or freedom that like past generations had, or that like I feel like I have. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had, and I've answered that question. I'm, I'm gonna let you. I'm sorry, Sen. I'm gonna uh, let you give Zach's uh, question and answer too. Just want to say real quick to that, Zach. You know, I've I've had the same conversation with people about. Um, they say I don't care. I wake up in the morning, I go to school or whatever. The life that you grew up in, that you've enjoyed, your parents enjoyed, our grandparents enjoyed is because the United States is the global leader. And when we're not the global leader anymore, a lot of things in your life every day, your day-to-day life will be dictated by the global leader. And that could be what sort of phone, the availability of that phone, how we import our food, other services, all that stuff. If you travel around the world right now, and people typically, they see that you're an American, they automatically think you have money, all this stuff, right? And you know, I, I know from traveling around the world that the American passport holds a lot of weight and where you're going. Um, and you watch some of those old movies before, they're like, oh, an American life, an American life is at stake or whatever, right? As if you know, an American life is more important than someone else's. But the, the point is, is they think that things will just stay the same and they won't because to me, it says that there's a broader misunderstanding of everything that comes together to give you your daily life in a first world United mm-hmm. States. And in, unfortunately, for most people, it takes not having something to realize what you had. Yeah. And that's this whole premise of my question is just kind of get it out on this podcast so mm-hmm. people who are listening, who are maybe like, I don't care if Taiwan gets invaded, it doesn't affect me today. I don't see how it affect me in the future. That's what I'm kind of getting at. If, if you could kind of break it down more uh, so know that like Please. why it affects the American people as much as it, as much as it will. Yeah. So going back, like, I guess societal, since I touched upon like the economics we, we, we've all did, but the societal changes that affect that China will be able to impose or potentially impose their view on society upon us, like they do in other countries. You kind of see that with Laos and Serbia, and I hate to say this in the Philippines, certain aspects, and the fact that they're able to say like, yeah, you know, you can mistreat your people, You can mistreat certain people if you don't like them. Sure, go ahead. You know, to us, that sounds insane. But if you look at what's happening in China right now with this various minority, especially the Tibetans and Uyghurs, Mm -hmm. you you see that as like, hey, we shouldn't do that. But most people don't really care about that because it's over there. Or Mm -hmm. it's over there in those countries. It's not affecting me. And that was another thing I was going to bring up the fact about Pearl Harbor because that was also another reason why I didn't really care. Oh, it's over there in the Pacific. It doesn't involve me. I'm trying to recover from the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. It's over there in Europe. Like Great Britain and France, or at least what's left of the French army, fight their war. We fought it in, war, in World War I. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. But it usually takes a an attack on U.S. citizens for us to realize not exactly exactly for us to realize you know what they they fucked around now it's time for them to find out (laughs) so that that's that's why i say like that's why i brought up there the uh the chinese attacking the bases in japan and okinawa and all throughout the pacific it's because they have to and they understand the calculus of the end results of that 
it would be them bringing in the United States to war. Yeah. And all its allies. <laughs> exactly. And that's something that China hates is the word allies, even though they have, even though they consider Pakistan, even though people, uh, people consider Pakistan an ally of China, they offer a lot of assistance to them, but there's no former like allegiance, mm -hmm. uh, 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 alliance with them. Mm -hmm. The only, uh, the only country they actually have a, any sort of military or security alliance with is North Korea. And that's actually is based why they base their negative outlook of alliances on, because when you have mm -hmm. a country who little, who you literally had to send a million plus arm uh, member army to go save because he bit off more than he can chew. Yeah. And then also and dealing with a lot about of the other doing crazy stuff at any moment that you might have to intervene for. <laughs> exactly. And so that's, so to them, they have to, so that, so them, it's like, what's the whole point of a line of, of having alliances? Yeah. We don't get this. We don't get the Western notion. You know, the other thing too, is I would ask people is the Chinese have a lot of influence in our mainstream media and all of our social media today. What makes you think if we were second to China, that that, influence that they have wouldn't be amplified times a thousand you yeah. know what i mean so it's it, that's well, another crazy thought too just just for exactly. people who are listening and might not be thinking of the, of the buy-in right you you didn't just hear it when seno said it is that um like they right now commit a lot of atrocities towards minority groups you think that after the conflict and they become number one that American citizens don't become a subgroup of humans to them. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to be freely. You're not going to be going to Chipotle on Tuesday. You're not like, you're going to be pretty much like the Jews were in Germany. You're going to be uh, specifically marked. You're going to be murdered. You're going to be weeded out. And any form of you being like, I like the constitution the founding fathers, democracy, the second amendment gone. It's not going to matter. Exactly. Like people think, Oh, I can just go into the Hills and, um, exist there. I don't need to deal with like the problem of a communist, uh, a Chinese dominated society. It's like, no, this they'll extend their tentacles to, um, to your, to your uh, homestead mm -hmm. because that's what they want. They want total control of a society and people and American people or the majority of American people don't, don't truly understand that. Even whenever you go into China, you see the culture shock of Americans who's like been there the first time, like, oh my God, like there's cameras everywhere. It's like, yeah, because you're, they're getting your face and like digitizing it and like running it yeah. every few, uh, every few seconds to keep track of you. Mm -hmm. Like, like you can't really just check in. So the check-in process within the Chinese and within any hotel and in China is completely different than here in the United States or even mm -hmm. abroad. Um, whenever you give them your passport, they scan it because that scanner will send that person an electronic copy to the local police department. And mm -hmm. if you have been known to say bad things or need to be you know, watched, then you may have a suspicious, you may suddenly have someone either telling you at the most extreme or detaining you or someone who will check in at like a couple hours after you in the hotel room, either across from you or beside you or either side of you. And they will just sit there and, or, and they'll just monitor you. And ironically enough, Whenever you leave, they'll leave. You go to these yeah. places, you, you go to the same places or some places. They, they, they know how to tell people. Mm -hmm. And so unless you want that same level of surveillance in the United States, then people should really care because that what China really wants to mm -hmm. export to all countries. Yeah. Uh, and I could see some sort of hellscape of if something like that, God forbid, were to ever happen. Of course, right? We have the Second Amendment. We have a ton of people in the United States who would defend their their homeland and their ways of life like they should. 
you know, the Chinese would do everything they can at first to do something politically to change the landscape. Politicians trying to legislate things to make, you know, maybe to get rid of rights and all this stuff. And, you know, they would try to go about it that way covertly before overtly doing something. And it would be with people that look like us and people that we elected or whatever. And that's how it would go. And they would want to destabilize and cause issues between uh, citizens of the United States like they already want. And it would get way worse. And it would be the best thing ever for them if some sort of civil war broke out because of that. Because then it really you are talking about a broken United States that is no longer a threat. And it would be that would be the victory without firing a shot, essentially. And they, um, could they arrive talk about as the, the aid to help you. It, Exactly. So, I mean, it, to me, at least, this is a, these are very scary thoughts. And you're not going to wake up every day and go put your egos in your toaster and, you know, just exist online chronically and play video games and go to bed. That's not going to be your, you know, your life. And it's just, I wish, and that's an aim, I know, Zach, you too, of, of trying to have this conversation is to you know, the audience is to hear that this these are possibilities, um, but these are why you should care, you know. So, um, you know, I, I really want to have this conversation just to, to set up the, the landscape about what this might look like if something were to happen in the Pacific as well. Um, you know, can we jump in on, you know, the nine dash line, first and second island chains? Um, just so people understand you know, where we're going and what those things mean, because I think that those aren't as common uh, terms uh, with this, at least civilians anyway, uh, what those things mean. Yeah, so the nine dash line is a, or it's also known as the Cal Tongue, um, mm -hmm. is the line that China uses to say that we own the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to understand is that Taiwan also uses the nine dash line, but they're not as vocal about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty much nine dashes to where it covers the southern half of, of, uh, of the South China Sea. Um, one of the more interesting aspects of this is whenever in, uh, Indonesia tried to act like a mediator or try to say, could you China or try to say like China shouldn't do this or should be to do less aggressive actions. Mm -hmm. China essentially extended the nine, the nine dash line to include <laughs> Indonesian Indonesian territory or Indonesian oh, Indonesian yeah? well uh, yeah it's like yeah bad. well um yeah <laughs> exactly okay you want to be involved say less. now you're involved yeah, yeah exactly and it's it's very funny that you know you you compare it over the years like oh they extended it mm -hmm. why because they needed to open their mouth <laughs> mm. right and so if you want problems you got problems Australia's exactly. going to be like hey stop that and next you know it's like off no, it's the a 27 of dash line yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, yeah, we we found a just made the list. Yeah, we, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, we found a a Ming dynasty or some some China. We we found yeah. a piece of part China uh, Chinese pottery on this random ship off the coast of uh, of uh, Australia. This whole section of Australia is now ours. Right. Get your <laughs> subs out of here. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, go, sorry, Canberra. Go away. You're now Chinese. <laughs> right you now you now you now identify as china right koala so, bears the, are now like panda bears they're ours exactly <laughs> they just go about repainting them yeah <laughs> just small birds china. right <laughs> to yeah. i can see that oh my right. god anyways nine dash line serious go back, go back yeah. to it <laughs> yeah so the, they use that as outlying hey they're um this is our territory. Anything within it, such as the Spatleys, is ours. They've actually used the same, the, the same argument that, hey, China historically has been in this region. We've actually laid claim to these islands since the Ming, uh, Ming dynasty, at least the Ming dynasty. And How far back is that? Until the late 1600s. Okay. You have to understand that the Ming... Uh, the Ming defeated the Mongol-dominated Yan uh, dynasty. The, okay. 1368 to 1644. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, yes, but um, they're... 
they would always cite the Ming Dynasty around fifteen fifteenth century and above and beyond that because mm-hmm. that's whenever you seen the Ming actually go out and explore. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, because Taiwan, uh, because China was always a land dominated country before that. And while you did see some notable explorations, such as, um, such as uh, Zheng He's uh, voyages to you know to Saudi Arabia, to the coast of Africa, the eastern coast of Africa, and um, and then also as uh, to Southeast Asia, anything beyond that, the Chinese argued like, why do we need to, why do we need to do these? outrageously expensive voyages mm-hmm. when we can use the money to solve our domestic issues. And, um, but yeah, so China uses the nine dash line to enforce their claim within right. some China Sea. Um, so I guess staying with the uh, nine dash line, South China Sea is that's also the reason why they built up those, uh, islands. Mm-hmm. I believe two to three, maybe upwards to four now. Mm-hmm. That uh, they pretty much transform from shoals or rocks that don't even poke up above the the water at most times mm-hmm. to square f- kilometer islands with the ability to land bombers, uh, have SAM sites, radar domes, SIGINT sites, things as that. I, I mean, I've seen about some pictures time. of these islands, man. They they like are real, but they have buildings on them, and like you said, airfields and all kinds of stuff. Barracks. It's pretty wild, honestly, and it's it's pretty genius because it's kind of like having an aircraft carrier that's that's out there, <laughs> you know, just to constantly have to you know you can land and take off from and all these you know advanced sites. Um, the nine dash line is is a a geographical marker that the rest of the world doesn't acknowledge though, right? Not they, as like in an official way. They don't officially acknowledge it because that's what China wants. Mm-hmm. They want to, they want people to acknowledge that we own this. Mm-hmm. It's a part of Chinese history. We've always dominated this area. Leave us alone. Uh, don't go through it. If you want to go through it, you have to ask our, our, our permission for, mm-hmm. They either transit or like go through it. Um, that goes for any vessel or, or plane. You have to ask our permission, and if we don't like, if we don't, if you feel like it, we don't have to let you go, let you in. This is like those videos you see of the Chinese Air Force or Navy talking to American or you know, Chinese Australian Navy pilots. The Chinese Navy, please divert. Exactly. Uh, this is the U.S. Navy. Fuck off. <laughs> Basically. Exactly. <laughs> right. So what's the significance then understanding and laying this landscape out of when you say first and second island chains, what do those mean? Like where they are, right? Geographically understanding the landscape and then militarily why they are significant. Yeah. So, so ge- geographically, it goes from extends to the north around the Kura Islands, all the way down to the Japanese home islands, the Ryukus. Mm-hmm. Taiwan, Mindanao, uh, Mindanao, the Philippines, Laos, uh, um, Luzon, um, Luzon, Pawan, mm-hmm. and islands that face upon the that face the South China Sea. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it's so important is because one, or at least from a uh, from a military aspect, is the fact that we're able to contain. China, right? That's also another reason why they would like to have Taiwan, mm-hmm. because without Taiwan, uh, with Taiwan, the first island chain is broken, right? So, if they're able to take over Taiwan, whether it be uh, or, uh, whether it be uh, peaceful, which they would they want to do, or or, or kinetic means, which they kind of don't want to do, but they're willing to to do it, they do, mm-hmm. they see there's no other point, there's no other recourse. And so for them, and so a lot of people don't understand or realize the importance of that, is that right now we have 
China contained. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're able to do a lot of operations within within the uh, within the island chain. They're able to go around and fly their planes. They're able to go and do these joint operations with Russia, do these uh, big scale military exercises. But the United States and other countries are able to do the same thing as well. Mm -hmm. They're able to transit. They're able to move around and say, hey, and, you know, pretty much at their free will. Yeah, right. China doesn't really project its power outside of, like, almost the borders of China, at least militaristically. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just butchered that word, but um, you, you don't hear about Africa. Chinese, you don't hear about Chinese like Navy ships, like in the Atlantic Ocean. You don't hear about Chinese like Navy ships, like, you know, over um, going down like the, like by Egypt or Israel or whatever. There's like merchant ships, but there's not like actual like destroyers and stuff moving around like the U.S. does. Well, they do, but I significantly decreased scale. Mm. They're they're able to project power but not on the same scale as the United States and other like and other powers like France or, mm -hmm. or Great Britain. Um they want to, but they can't. And that's the reason why it's very important to point out that they're able to do these operations, project these power project their power within that area. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we're able to do that too from across the globe and other countries as well. And the United and the China can't really do anything about it, except mm -hmm. for play the uh, audio recordings of "This is Chinese waters, territorial waters, <laughs> your space. Please leave, or bad right. things will happen to you." In which the United States and other countries, it's like, bye. <laughs> Kick it's kind of like when Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan. There was a bunch of threats that were all empty. They're gonna shoot <laughs> they her plane out of the sky. A, it's like okay, right? They threw a massive temper tantrum about it and didn't do anything. Exactly. It was just um, voicing their displeasure. They mm -hmm. they weren't going to do anything because they understood that even though the United States was, or you know, we're in the process of rearming or repivoting our military to more focus upon the the Asia Pacific region, realistically, we will be able to answer any kinetic attack. But then not only that, but them shooting down a U.S. House of Representative and her group is not yeah. war. And yeah. so they understood that. Like, it's one of those things in which they, they voiced around. They said, yeah, we want to sh we'll shoot it down. We'll, we'll um, escort it. In which they didn't. Because mm -hmm. they knew that that would be the worst game of fuck around and find out that they would ever play. That'd be the modern Gavrilo Princeps shooting Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the car in Serbia. That's what that would be. Exactly. Yeah. So with the second, the first and second island chains, why are they so significant for the United States Navy as far as projecting power? Uh, I'll just jump right in on um, the technological advancements that the Chinese have made to deter the United States from being able to attack the Chinese should we go to war, right? So the, uh, the DF-21, DF-17 um, missiles they have that they say can hit the uh, carrier strike groups and prevent the United States from... Uh, you know, getting jets inside mainland China, um, everything that they'd want to do, prevent movement, right, which would all be extremely crippling things to the United States Navy should we go kinetic with them. So what what role and why is that so important? Um, and then how accurate is it that the Chinese say they can actually hit those carrier strike groups with those new missiles, those hypersonic, hypersonic missiles? So going upon your first question, like how... Mm -hmm significant these are to military or de defense strategies that they almost think of them as almost defense lines that we can hold them here if they try to pierce it then it would be extremely it would be extremely costly for them over time that kind of changed because they're able to utilize the different ballistic missiles things like that including the anti-ship ballistic missiles the f-21 and the f-17 like you pointed out bannon mm -hmm. But realistically, it's hard to hit a moving target. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons why um, there was a Chinese research paper that came out, I believe in May, that actually mm -hmm. talked about the, the potential for these missiles to, uh, to be able to, to successfully destroy a carrier group. Mm -hmm. Now, 
that paper, I mean, I, I believe you read it. Uh, I believe you and uh, you and Zach read it because mm-hmm. I wrote about this in the bulletin. Yeah, where I critiqued it. Right, and they said that we're able to destroy ninety percent of the carrier group in over twenty year iterations. Mm-hmm. However, when you do, however, when you read it, it's a very small carrier group, like one almost only represented by one one carrier, one. Uh, one uh, one uh, Tyrone class cruiser, I believe, four destroyers, arguably mm-hmm. class destroyers, mm-hmm. and not only that, but they said like we were able to destroy it. But then a Taiwanese uh, think tank took the same study and tried to replicate the results, mm-hmm. and they found something extremely different. Um, they came up with only two ships. Wow. Using using the same conditions, using the same so-called constraints. And those the majority of the time they were either a, two destroyers or one carrier or one one destroyer and one cruiser. Mm-hmm. One time one or two times they were able to strike they were able to sink a carrier, but right. most times destroyers. And the reason why they were able to even and so they've changed up the battle or they changed up the scheme. And so they've stopped. The most important thing is that they stopped the carrier group in its tracks. Okay. So it was a moving, it was just, it just stopped. Mm-hmm. And so from there, they were able to destroy it. And then not only that, but they've uh, decreased the, but they also turned off all the active and passive countermeasures that the ships would have. Mm-hmm. to be able to deploy and so just those two is that um, what happened yeah, yeah. so there's still two bait and that's when uh, exactly it's like and then from there that's when the Taiwanese researchers started to see the same numbers so mm-hmm. it showed that they were going on a flawed premise that we will stop the uh that we will stop this that we will stop our carriers and won't launch everything that we have mm-hmm. exactly back. and then also they wanted those results to come out. And so uh, this is one of those things in which. I know for sure yeah. that if an aircraft carrier was like sinking or going down, every possible plane is getting off that aircraft carrier. And mm-hmm. that thing is launching everything it has as it's sinking. Like it's. it's yes. <laughs> it's not just going to go, oh, dang it, I'm sinking. We'll see you later, guys. Nah. Right. <laughs> everything's going off. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, like everything is going to be going off. But not only that, but just the fact that they think, you know, one or two cruise uh, ballistic missiles will take care of it, even though, like, it may have, like, um, you know, MRVs, uh, multiple uh, mm-hmm. launch vehicles. Right. Uh, and um, be able to, like, destroy the, to totally destroy the carrier through you know, shotgunning it. Right. Um, just the mere fact that they think one or two missiles will be able to take destroy it, it kind of flies in the face of what the Navy found out in the early 2000s mm-hmm. when they tried to sink a carrier. Yeah. Actually, one of the predecessors of the um, of the Nimitz class, I think. Right. It was a Ford class carrier, wasn't it? They, that's on YouTube. The, no, it wasn't a Ford class carrier. Mm-hmm. It was an earlier one. Okay. Uh, I forget. Yeah, it was, I forgot. It was like in the early 2000s. Okay, and they um, it took them two two weeks, and they expended a lot of ordnance on it, and it was two still weeks. standing. Yes, it was still standing, <laughs> or still selling. And so, what ended up happening? Yeah. Um, so, what ended up happening is that they had to send in a team to rig up the uh, rig up the carrier to to explode, to sink. Well, I know, like it's during incredible. like after World War Two, and the U.S. was like practicing and testing their nukes and stuff out in like bikini i bikini atoll or whatever i can't remember mm-hmm. B- bikini atoll. atoll yeah mm-hmm. um those were old like world war ii ships that they were going to decommission anyways and they were nuking them and they still couldn't sink some of those and it has something to do with like unless the nuke actually like hit the actual uh ship it wouldn't it, it would get super irradiated and yeah all the people would probably be dead on it but the ship would still be yeah. there Right. Just chilling. Like so. We'll just keep landing planes on it. Yeah, you're good. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. Like it, 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 even nuclear warheads, if it's like not directly, as you pointed out, directly on top of it, mm-hmm. or land directly on top of it, that, it's not going to destroy it. And so we're talking about a Navy carrier that took not only technological advancements, but also the code of experience of World War II and us trying to develop an unsinkable or a nigh unsinkable carrier. Mm-hmm. And, the, and not only that, but the um, the Ford class, the one that they use in the study, also just continue upon that. So it's mm-hmm. it's one of those things in which you read the uh, when you read the study when you read the research paper, you realize that one it's very biased and two it's like almost propaganda at that point. Mm-hmm. So playing devil's advocate with this, right? Assuming, let's say that those missiles could do what the Chinese say they could do, or at least a fraction of what they say they could do. What does that do to limit the United States' uh, military ability? You know, if, if the United States can't get close enough to China, right? What does that mean for us in a battle there in the Pacific? I think what it means for us is that it would complicate planning. Mm-hmm. We won't be able to project our power at minimum mm-hmm. to the south uh, to the um, first island chain mm-hmm. not only that but just the fact that um, it would also prevent it would also give the chinese free ability to actually conduct operations within not only the first island chain but also the second island chain mm-hmm. and while negating our ability and then and then also even if we were to try to operate there, it would, the planners would have to take into account, hey, hey, how long can we, how long can we operate here in this location, in this vicinity until, you know, a Chinese satellite or a Chinese uh, PLA, uh, a People's Liberation Army Navy aircraft spots us. Mm-hmm. And so it's goes, you have to go, it, re- it would reduce operations. And mm-hmm. then to where we would have to either, you know, move quickly on and pick up the air, pick up the aircraft um, from the mission at another spot or um, or conducting small short mission missions to where we would have to limit our objectives for those for them significantly. Well, I know that the Navy and the Air Force, because let's be honest, they're, these are the two branches of the U.S. military that would be the most crucial should something like this happen, are working heavily on having aircraft that have longer range so that they don't have to rely going inside those closer island chains. Um, so, I mean, at least the United States is, uh, they see the issue and they're trying to remedy it. But I think you would probably agree, so that the Chinese would prioritize taking out bases in Okinawa and Guam over um, taking out carrier strike groups or focusing on those because that would limit our ability to resupply and, you know, take off a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So they would strike those, they would destroy those, um, those uh, bases. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why you've seen, you know, not only the U S Navy Air Force, but also the Marine Corps and army be able to, the, uh, in a weird way, resurrect Tidane islands such as Tinian, uh, Saipan, um, other islands across the South Pacific to where they can operate, disperse, mm-hmm. uh, disperse operations. You kind of you even see that in the Japanese uh, in the Japanese strategy now, mm-hmm. uh, and but then also in the U.S. Marine Corps strategy to operate from small those small islands that make up the Ryu groups. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe the United States is actively doing it mm-hmm. in one in one island in one on a couple of islands off the off the coast of Okinawa, but then also Japan is in the process of creating little bases, little logistical warehouses, and, mm-hmm. and anti ship ballistic or anti ballistic missile bases all along the Ryukyu Island chain to make it to where if the if the Pelian, if the if the plan wants to go in, if the Chinese Navy wants to go in, wants to pass pass the Miyaku uh, Straits, which is the strait they have to pass through to to exit the South China uh, South China uh, to exit the uh, first island chain, mm-hmm. then they would have to run the gauntlet, if you will, mm-hmm. of not only 
anti ship list uh, anti ship cruise missiles, but then also Japanese aircraft mm -hmm. and Japanese naval forces as well, in which they have significantly more experience and knowledge in how to conduct combat operations than the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So what are the most recent American estimates of what damage the Chinese could do immediately? Let's say, you know, within the first couple of days, should they invade Taiwan and we go to blows? I think it would be the total or the near total destruction of every base in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Um, with an emphasis on Fatima and Kadena, mm. they would. I wouldn't be too surprised if both if both air bases were to receive at least three volleys of cruise missiles, mm -hmm. or, or or at the very least some type of soft operation, follow up operation, to Ooh. continue to the to deny the ability for those uh, for the United States to repair those uh, repair those sites. Mm -hmm. Now moving on to mainland Japan, you kind of see the same thing. Will some sites survive? Of course, um, possibly Sasebo, maybe even the northern bases because the Chinese wouldn't be able to launch or won't be able to uh, launch the missiles without Japanese aircraft or air defenses getting in the way. Mm -hmm. But the more south you go, the increase in destruction. So Yokosuka, Yokosuka will probably be the northernmost island that will be hit. Mm -hmm. But then after that, um, Yokota, pretty much every, Yokota, um, Nagasaki, I believe is where the Seventh Fleet is based, huh? Yeah, again, <laughs> <laughs> but th this time there Sorry. won't be sun. There won't be. <laughs> this time there won't be a sun. Yeah, um, that's what you think. <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Be a big difference. Yeah, exactly. And um, but yeah, you'll be seeing them strike those bases. And Yakuni things, they, those those places, mm -hmm. and you'll and to again either being totally totally destroying them or or just or uh, damaging them to the point to where realistically the Japanese uh, the Chinese or the um, the U.S. would not be able to operate from them. They mm -hmm. include using the uh, aircraft or any of the equipment there. Mm -hmm. Do you think China um, would attempt attempt to take land in this like first couple of days as well, like um, completely obliterate like Okinawa and then take it? Do you think that's a possibility? I don't think they'll take Okinawa. Will they okay. take the Senkaku's? Of course, they'll probably try to take it just to add insult to injury to the Japanese mm -hmm. because that was another island that was that they considered part of the hundred years of humiliation. And they're probably they're probably invading Taiwan boots on the ground at the same time as this is happening. Like that's literally like a rock stone throw away, right? Exactly. Yeah. So for them to I think the mass they won't try to outright invade mm -hmm. any of those uh islands. They'll probably try to like land soft or to complicate efforts for us to mm -hmm. continue to use the bases, us and the Japanese. Surround them, and maybe. Exactly. Maybe surround them or perhaps um, using the continued threat of additional missile attacks to prevent us from actually landing there, landing troops or getting people off the island. Mm -hmm. And which they, they don't care. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty certain they wouldn't really care if people get off the island. It's just the fact that they just don't want people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so going out further, Guam would be it would be hit because they they have to take the chance of of them actually striking Guam because it's a nexus. It's a halfway point between the United States, Hawaii, and Australia, and Okinawa, mm -hmm. and Japan, and South Korea. It's also like a huge yeah. bomber base. Yeah, exactly. It's where the retaliation so is probably going to come from. Exactly. So they'll so they'll make it a point to strike all those bases within the. Within oh, oh, within Japan, but then also try to take take out Guam, mm -hmm. just to be able to cause us to just to be able to cause us to complicate the um, uh, complicate our plans to be able to and to be able to not to respond um, as effectively as we could. Mm -hmm. Now, will they succeed? 
a force. Um, depending upon um, how they do this, depending upon if they do it at day, night, if we knew they're coming, then the success rate would be dramatic, would decline dramatically. Now, if they do it as a sneak attack, then of course it would be increased. But regarding Guam, I kind of see it surviving, even mm-hmm. though the Japan, even though the Chinese would try its best to destroy it. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this: uh, two parts of this question. What is the United States' ability to retaliate and bounce back, as far as like taking a punch and recovering? Right, and obviously this is. You know, we're, we can only speculate because we have no idea what the level of damage would be if you're talking about just missile saturations on airfields or whatever. But, um, you know, let's just feasibly say, like, you, you sunk several, maybe an aircraft carrier, right? Several of those ships, you struck, you know, these bases. How quickly can the United States bounce back um, infrastructure-wise, personnel, that kind of thing? It would take them probably around two to three weeks for them to move. Uh, to move additional units to the region. Not only that, mm-hmm. but to be able to uh, build up any new sites. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to where the United States actually uh, created these ad hoc airfields in Tinian and other places within South China, uh, within the South South Pacific. Mm-hmm. So you'll see them try to get those as operational as they can in a short amount of time, but then also it will take a large, a large degree of mobilization, mm-hmm. especially in Hawaii or in Alaska, because depending upon how China uh, would feel about it, they would pop, they would also probably strike those as well. Yeah, I kind of doubt it because th- at that point it's considered a strike against the U.S. homeland. Mm-hmm. Home right. So I think that's where they would draw the line. Mm-hmm. But they'll be, but we'll be able to use Hawaii and and Alaska as uh, as waypoints, as new waypoints to push troops out to Pacific. Does that mean China will give us free will, free uh, free reign around there? Of course not. They would probably they would probably deploy their submarine force around there, mm-hmm. so that any ships or any any ships or any other naval vessel leaving would have to run the risk of being sunk by a Chinese sub. I actually think that's probably an area where the Chinese are significantly behind the United States. Um, I feel like that is an area where we would excel exceedingly is our submarines in that area. I think that uh, that's not a topic that a lot of people discuss uh, very much when we talk about this, this battle, these naval battles, missiles, anti-missiles, stuff like that. But that I think United States subs are going to be that ace in the hole, so to speak. Um, and I know I saw something recently, um, I think I shared it with you, Sano, about how the United, uh, excuse me, the Chinese are saying they can start tracking um, U.S. subs a lot better um, based on the bubbles that come off of the rotor blades uh, on the subs. But um, you were saying that that's probably uh, not as accurate as the South China Morning Post is insinuating. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to my earlier point that I pointed out. Mm-hmm. And the uh, other research paper that I talked about the mm-hmm. DFW or the DF uh, ballistic anti ship ballistic missiles. Mm-hmm. Whenever something like that occurs, and whenever you see a research paper like that being published, if the Chinese do not have it out there on public domain or even mm-hmm. in their uh, little research the CKNI, mm-hmm. their research paper. Uh, database, mm-hmm. then they don't want that information to be coming out. They don't want that information to come out. And for two reasons. One is because they don't want that technology to leave China. They don't want other people to steal it as ironically enough as that may sound. Yeah. Um, okay. Exactly. Um, but more importantly is that it may not be entirely true mm-hmm. as the other research paper as other people may have, as, as the other research team in Taiwan pointed out. Mm-hmm. In that paper, right, in the other paper, and so this has always been a holy grail for the Chinese is to find some way to detect Western subs, not 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 mm. just the United States, but just Western subs in general. Because realistically, this is also another reason why they hated the fact that under the 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 Australia UK 
uh, oh, United States deal. Ancus mm-hmm. um, deal is that the United States and Great Britain is able to give nuclear propulsion technology, nuclear sub technology to Australia. Mm-hmm. That's the reason why they they had a literal like uh, t- temper tantrum for mm-hmm. you know, weeks on end is because that was their tact mission that the the uh, that their anti uh, anti uh, sub warfare is mm-hmm. lacking. Significantly. Yeah. And so that's the reason why they made it a point to say, oh, we found this new technology that will be able to detect subs. Mm. May, it may not be the case because they just, that's like for them a holy grail, in which not only that, but then other technologies, as, as, as um, magnetic uh, detection, mm-hmm. magnetic field detectors. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like a P3 or a P8 or like um, any other mm-hmm. anti. Uh, okay, so yeah, P3 most more, but yeah, so you have yeah. Okay, so for a P three or anyone else, you you notice that they have like an elongated tail at the mm-hmm. end, right? That's a mad magnetic anomaly detector. Hmm. That's what that tail does. Like it yeah. just it just flies there and just soaks up it like magnetic fields that they detect an anomaly, then they don't investigate it more. Yeah, when I was stationed at Kadena, there was like. There's like 12 or so of them sitting on the runway. They're operated by the Navy, the U.S. Navy, little P3s, mm-hmm. and we call them submarine sniffers. Exactly. Yeah, that's pretty much what they do. Right. Like, that's their bread and butter. Hmm. Um, the P8s kind of took over the role, but the secondary role of being given to their version of Global Hawk or the Navy, Navy's version of Global Hawks. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that's going to work out, but whatever <laughs> yeah it's like um it's a small or, or like this when you compare the global hawk to a p3 it's like kind of the p3 is bigger so it's like you can okay. fit more stuff on it it's like i don't really see the point i don't really see the the rationale behind it but anyways they they want to find these new technologies these disruptive technologies well because they they know or they want to say that would be their ace in the hole to be able to find and detect and destroy the subs because right now they don't really have it. Mm-hmm. They don't even really have a adequate analog to the P8 or P3. Hmm. They don't. They have one, but they're still trying to figure out like how to operate it. It's not on and even then. Exactly. Then also like the range is kind of funky the capabilities may not be as good as a P3 as a P3 or P8. And so mm-hmm. it's one of those things in which you see that as a you kind of see that as them just saying that yeah, we don't have a good enough capability. Right. And so them trying so it's them just trying to get anything that would give them a leg up. Even then, even if it is true, and I think I talked to you about this uh talk talk to you about this, the fact that this um, technology or this experiment is based upon, or this research is based upon uh, experiments done in a laboratory setting mm-hmm. down their best and their perfect conditions, mm-hmm. or at least, better per- and like, at least the most perfect conditions possible. And it, and will that exactly translate to? And will that exactly translate to um, operational to conditions? Yeah. Exactly, well, operational conditions, real life conditions. Yeah, and so most times it may not be, even mm-hmm. if the Chinese were to try to hurriedly advance this to the operational stage, it will still take time to actually develop the tactics, doctrine. And equipment needed for this because you just can't strap it on to like um, a Y8 or Y9 mm-hmm. and tell it to go off, tell the commander to go off and go do great things. You, you just, you just can't do that. It's, it's that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have to develop a whole new variant, if not a whole new aircraft for it, mm-hmm. because I believe. That the um, because I believe that the actual uh, P 
piece of equipment that detects the bubbles, it has to be dipped in. Right. So even then, that kind of regula regulates it to a rotary rotary craft, mm -hmm. which would be their their version of the Z20. And that should also tell you that they're more focusing upon rotary blade uh, mm -hmm. uh, helicopters for the- A lot uh, of reading between the lines. Mm -hmm. Exactly. For the anti anti sub warfare will, as opposed right. to the to the U.S., it's a combination. I'm not too worried actually about China being able to detect our submarines because I don't think mm -hmm. they can at all. Or they could probably have like through seismic stuff, they could probably hear them or whatever. That's fine, but I don't think they ever know where they actually are uh, because the U.S. doesn't even know where our submarines are sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, well. I because I, I had a buddy, he's not in the Navy anymore. He worked on submarines. And he told me that there are times for like weeks that those submarines will go like offline. You know, they're not, they're super far deep. And the U.S. government knows where they're supposed to be. But they don't actually know where they are. So like if they're following the route that was like top secret or whatever and that the Pentagon is aware of, cool. But if that submarine wanted to go rogue... You don't know where it Red is. October. It's it's Red gone. October. Like <laughs> you don't know October. where it is. <laughs> it's got Sean Connery down there, right? <laughs> an Irish, an Irish sound, a uh, Scottish sounding. Um, yeah, some uh, Bostonian trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, Zach, that's actually it's by design. Yeah, mm. you know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty smart. Yeah. yeah. Because if we can know where they are, then that means anyone can know where they are. So don't just, I don't exactly. want to know where they are. <laughs> exactly. So for people to say that, you know, for people, you know, this is, this is the whole thing that I kind of agree with whenever, you know, generals and admirals will say like, oh, if you're an admitter, if you're admitting, then you're a target. Or if you're, if you like, you're on the spectrum, electron, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I agree with that. And that's one of the reasons why they, why submarines do that. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. also why submarine commanders, aren't they like all, I'm pretty sure they're all one stars, aren't they? Like they're not low ranking individuals. One, they have the ability to launch nukes and then like they're entrusted like to do the right thing when you're supposed to, like, you don't need to be micromanaged. We don't need to know everything you're doing. Just go into the water and chill. If I well, remember correctly, let me look not it up. Exactly, I, th I think they are high. Ranking. I think they're they're Probably lieutenant at least colonels. Oh, okay. Oh, five, yeah, they're, they're captains. Yeah, I think they're captains. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and I think, and the reason why is because, like, one is like the degree of experience you get from like operating, you know, boomers or nukes or things such as that. But then not only that, but just the fact that um, you have the trust, they have their trust. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of amount of trust from the commanders, from the one stars, mm -hmm. from the three stars, from the president even, because nukes. Right. AR-06s. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, we were talking about AUKUS a little bit, um, which obviously is an alliance the United States, the UK, and Australia have. But where is the United States gaining and losing ground with other allies in the region? Oh wow! Um, this is a very interesting. Uh, this is a very interesting comment uh, question. Okay. No, because I'm. This is actually something that I'm. This is actually another project. That I'm You're the perfect on. person to answer this question. It sounds like nice. Exactly. <laughs> um, Good. Where they're running a foul with AUKUS at? Uh, I, because this will be the easier easier one to to answer. Okay. Ironically enough, um, would be a lot of the countries within Southeast Asia. Such as in especially Indonesia and mm -hmm. Malaysia, um, uh, Singapore not so much. They actually love AUKUS. That we we support it, but they also come at. Uh, they also have the balance between China as well. Mm -hmm. And they said like, yeah, we love this, but we need to get along, guys. Please, <laughs> please, <Yeah>. please. <laughs> We're in the um, middle. Yeah, because it will not only that, but they a lot of people don't realize is that there's a small U.S base a joint base mm -hmm. in in singapore yeah so 
that's kind of the reason why they had the balance. Yeah. Even though they don't the United States aside. Mm-hmm. And so, but, and then farther afield, you have countries such as New Zealand who, you know, they, they understand the need for it, but they, they're not going to join it or they're not going to, and, and they're going to not let any subs, uh, you, uh, Australian subs, uh, uh, port there anymore once mm-hmm. they become operational, which is ironic because there have been reports that they let Chinese Navy sub Navy subs that had nuclear warheads on them oh. uh, uh, be stationed there or uh, call the port there. So what? it's like, are you really? Um, Damn. As a whole, Oceania is totally is is uh, behind Akas, with the exception of Solomon Islands, which. Mm-hmm given because they're pretty much a, a Chinese puppet at this point. Yeah. Um, the on the fence people, um, in, in addition to Singapore, Vietnam, they understand the, the they understand the necessity of it, but they also don't really want to be a part, part of it. Okay. Um, Cambodia is against it. Hmm. Obviously Laos is against it. Two, two of China's biggest friends in the in the region, mm-hmm. they do the bidding of China. Yeah, um, Thailand, they're again they're for it, which ironically enough um, shocked me because they've been increasing their military ties with China mm-hmm. recently. Yeah, and and that kind of and that's kind of concerning because Taiwan or not Taiwan but Thailand, you can actually see the bear rather. Of who has more influence within the region at any yeah. given time from outside outside players, yes. And the reason why is because Thailand is the only country within the Southeast Asia region that did not become a colony of either the United, uh, United States, Great Britain, France, Netherlands, anyone else. That's interesting. And they done yeah, and they done that through and the king who was in power at that time done it through skillful di- diplomacy, but then also developing a uh, relationship with the United States. Mm-hmm. And so even though the, you see this, even though they always had a relationship with the United States as a backup plan, or at least at that time, they still had the balance between the two powers, two outside regional powers at the time, which was mm-hmm. France and the British Empire. And in addition to Skillful diplomacy, they also gave up some lands mm-hmm. um, that the British and French wanted. So Laos, they gave up Laos. Well, at least okay. the majority of the uh, majority of the uh majority of the uh of the land that would become Laos. Okay. And then for the case of um uh Great Britain, the majority of the Shan states, so what would become the Shan states located in Myanmar. All right. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, so and then to see them becoming more closer to China is very interesting because uh, while also maintaining the United States aspect of, of the relationship is very interesting because one, you kind of hope it maintains it or at least the fact that, you know, or at least the United States gains some more security influence within the country. But, but if at most have a mate, maintain it mm-hmm. or at least have me have Th- uh, thailand maintain it between china and united states but um if you do see china or you, if you do see Thai- uh, thailand pivoting towards uh, china mm-hmm. especially in the security sense like they lessen like lessen gl- uh, uh cobra gold's reach or they've they cancel start. They start canceling exercises. Then that is an indication that they are pivoted towards China. Yeah, China. But Myanmar, they hate it. But that's due to the junta itself, not not so much as being a supporter of China or the United States. Just mm-hmm. the junta, just the the uh, junta uh, dominated government just doesn't like outsiders and also having a highly a big nationalistic streak. Bangladesh, you kind of see them for it, but they also understand that um, 
they would have to be a they have to be a middle power between not only China and the United States but India as well, which leads me to India. That's India one, likes man. it. India likes it. They they don't they they don't mind it. They don't see the they see the point in this, right? But yeah, let's talk about will India. we see? Yeah, will we see India become a quad? Will, will, they, will we see AUKUS become the quad, a quad-like um, country? Mm-hmm. I doubt it because one, the United States, Great Britain, would be uncomfortable with transferring that information to or the the, the, the technology and information exactly to India. But then on the flip side, India would be uncomfortable with trying to. Um, increase relationships with those countries because of China. They still, they don't want to antagonize China, but then also they don't want to, they want to go their own way. They also want to become like a, this regional hegemon saying that, hey, we're here, we're no longer under any colonial masters, aka yeah. Great Britain. Um, we want our own way. And I, I don't really see them continuing down that path because even even some within the their dip, dip, diplomatic and foreign and uh, foreign affairs and security communities defense defense security communities understand that China's a threat. We experienced them tr- invading 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 and going to war with us multiple times. We know they're a threat. And so while we have allies who think the same way, we need to pivot towards them. Mm-hmm. But they get drowned out by the Mahdi's and the more the more extreme voices of the BJP. Right. And so, yeah, it's one of those things in which I'll, it's like 50-50. Um, some countries like it, AUKUS, because of what it represents. Others don't. And then others are neutral. India holds pretty big keys with um, helping or hindering Chinese uh, trade in that area and not wanting to just basically be the doormat that the Chinese wish they would be. And the other thing that is interesting to the dichotomy between the Chinese and Indian relationship is are these border disputes that happen all the time. I mean, these guys are literally fighting each other, but you don't hear it in the news as often as I think you should, considering them being the size they are, the global powers that they are in their region. Um, You know, so I think both the United States and the Chinese would love to see India make a decision, right? And like you said, India wants to be their own person. Um, But where do do you think if something happens, where do you see India leaning more towards? If something does happen, India would try its best to stay out. Mm -hmm. But then also, at least right now, they will try their best to, to stay out of it, but they know eventually they'll be drawn in mm-hmm. to any conflict. They'll be drawn into conflict because China may use China may actually conduct operations along the border to you know, prevent them from from uh, prevent them from actually coming to the aid of the aid of the United States and Taiwan, mm-hmm. or the fact that they don't. Or, or the fact that they may not even want them involved at all. Right. They may try to play the fact that, hey, if they don't want to get involved, then we shouldn't antagonize the Hindu the Hindu elephant. Mm-hmm. So they may try to, so they may not even do anything at all. But for them, they would understand that they would have to, they would have to get involved eventually. Right. Because if Taiwan falls and, you know, they get the territory back, then that means they then that means they would have to pivot their focus upon getting territory back at least from the Chinese perspective mm-hmm. to those um to those um to those strips of land along the Chinese uh Indian borders because that's another remnant of the hundred years of humiliation but then also with that uh the colonial era for mm-hmm. both sides. Where do you see the United States Navy make going in the right direction, and where do you see it going in the wrong direction? 
they need to figure out what to do with the um they need to figure out what to do with the um I forgot what those little ships are called. Littoral? Yeah, the, the littoral combat ships, which mm-hmm. I don't know how they're called combat when the modulars the modulars that are supposed to enable them to com- to conduct combat. Right. Uh, have failed, failed to fail to repair even after like 20 or so years. Because of total failure, that whole concept. And we keep, mm-hmm. we keep, obviously, like we're in a contract where we have to keep buying them too, right? And having mm-hmm. them produced, which is, which is fucking crazy. Exactly. And I think, and this is the thing about that contract or about the ships, the, the freedom and the America class. I, I forget what's, I forget yeah. what they, what, what's the other one are called. But no one, exactly wants look it up. no one wants them. <laughs> right. Exactly. No one wants them. And that should be an indication of how useless these ships are. Right. Like, maybe, I mean, we could try to give them to the Coast Guard, but what are the I ships doubt... called again? Littor- L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. Littoral. Pretty sure I'm saying that right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These are useless. I remember these. Yeah. They... <laughs> oh, Thank you. I remember, they, I remember what they look like. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No one's happy no, like, with these pieces of tin. I remember when I saw yeah, them, like, I was like, how is this a combat ship? It's got like one gun. Like, who's it shooting at? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, they, they tried putting, like, um, the new anti ship cru- uh, cruise missile on it. Mm-hmm. But even then, it's like one or two shots before you have to go back to port or go back to a planet ship to reload. It's like, right. is it really. Did you really increase its effectiveness any? No. Even then, like it's not capable of like long-term deployments at sea, like you would like would be needed for, um, like would be needed for any type of uh, Pacific campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, being able to uh, island hop, but even then, it would be limited to what I, uh, missions it could to conduct. Mm-hmm. I so mean, we only have two of these. No, we have like there's a ton. Yeah. Oh, fifty two. Mm-hmm. Why so many? And so oh. correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Arleigh Burt class, that's on its way out, right? Yes, it's planned to look to be de- decommissioned in batches. Um, I think we're we're still building them because, mm-hmm. you know, over time we're gonna we're moving away uh, over time we're gonna develop the new ones. Um, but yeah, the, the Ollie Burke class is slowly, or it's going to be phrased out because mm-hmm. it's, it's an old design. I believe 40, 30 or 40 years years old at this point. Um, what's, um, what they're doing right, or at least I'll continue with what they do wrong first. Yeah. They still haven't really considered a, topic. yeah, they, they haven't really considered a, or at least, uh, settled upon a new cruiser mm-hmm. um, type or design um, that is significant because the cruisers are the main ship and anti-ship ballistic missile defense or anti-ship or anti um, or an, and, uh, anti-air air capabilities it can provide okay. gotcha. for carrier groups or for like ARGs or amphibious ready groups things as like that Mm-hmm. And so, for them to not settle upon a design or like not have them being be built yet, it's kind mm-hmm. of it's kind of alarming to me, especially since they're alarming. now beginning to yeah, especially now since they're um, going away with the Tyong, uh the TIG class mm-hmm. cruisers. Excuse me. Um, this is a big the tech- gap isn't it between the United States and the Chinese, as far as even technical capabilities on these ships, radar systems, uh, weapon systems, sh- ship defense systems, all these things. Not yes. As of right now, mm-hmm. they have their own, they have their own, uh, dragon eye, um, dragon eye, uh, radar. Okay. And it's, people say it's an analog to the, uh, to the AGs, mm-hmm. but I doubt it because one it's Chinese. And then two, they more likely copied it from nice. China. Mm-hmm. So it's like, or they, they more than likely copied it from the United States. So it's mm-hmm. like, 
they're good at copying, but will they be able to add stuff to the design if they don't already know what to do with it? Right. More likely not. But even then, like the quality of the radars may not be the best. Mm-hmm. So there's so you have to take that in consideration. But even then, it still gives them a massive capability than what they had before. Okay. Uh, also, fun fact, if you look up different um, pictures of the Dragon Eye, mm-hmm. you see that they originally, I don't know if Zach's able to do this, but... Um, I can. He can do all things. <laughs> oh, very, very well. Yeah. Type in type in Dragon Dragon Eye variants. I think you should be able to find um, define both, both, both types. Both A, I believe, or the or at least the initial uh, prototype, and the um, finished version, or the one that reached operational status. It's a big. There's a reason why I say. Well, I'll, there's a reason why I say um, they may have copied the. They may have stolen it from the ages. Hmm. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. No, it wouldn't be the first time. It could be the but... last. <laughs> it, exactly exactly that but this is so blatant that you can't really deny it it's kind of like well, looking I'm, at the j20 you're like oh wow there's yeah. such dis- obvious design characteristics <laughs> right i mean the j20 in of itself is kind of is it really stealth yeah which for people like, listening is is a Chinese uh, stealth fighter. We use uh, parentheses and say stealth fighter loosely. I was yeah. at yeah. when I was stationed on Okinawa. I went down for a flyaway mission to an air show in Australia. This was like two thousand mm-hmm. two thousand thirteen. I want to say two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen, and uh, China was invited, and they brought like some stealth. I, I don't know if it was the J twenty or whatever, but they brought uh the j20 there and um it never flew it sat on the runway and they were all like yeah it's really cool da, da. and then you had the u.s flying like all their the f-22 like all their cool stuff like australia's flying plane like, everyone else is flying their planes and china's plane just sits at the end of the runway and no one was allowed to go like even close to it it was like, super far away and when it when it came in it didn't fly in either it like just came in on a that. cargo aircraft. Like it didn't, it didn't fly in. It didn't fly anywhere. It was just sitting there. It's like a paperweight. It was still in his research stages. Yeah, um, it still is. I wonder if it was being used for alternate means. <laughs> just picking up my cell phone thing while I was on yeah, Instagram yeah. or something. I mean, just bring it in. Let it soak up whatever. I don't know. These That's Dragonite nope. variants, you're talking about like the domes on their ships, right? The little radar circle things? Yeah, uh, some, like the finished version of it should be like flat on the, like, I don't know if you've ever seen like RG's class, uh, the, the radars on like the TIG class cruisers. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. like two big p- panels. Yeah. So yep. that's kind of like what you see in the Chinese cruisers, right? Yeah. I've like, seen them now. Not the same. Yeah, they're not the same. But if there should be some pictures of like the earliest variant in which all it was was just a spinning radar dish. Right. <laughs> that was the dragon eye. And I'm just like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if, I'm gonna, this I'm gonna save this picture. I'm gonna send it to you. Uh, Are you able to share it on your screen? I don't know if I can share it on my screen. I don't think I have that ability on here. Damn. But yeah, it's like oh, I know you, I can. You, I can share a screen. Yes, I can. Share your screen. Share your screen. Give me Let's a sec. This. Let me make this bigger. All right, share screen. This one. It popped up yet? Can you guys see it? Yes, no? it's thinking. It's yeah. thinking about it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think they were just they didn't want to fly it because they didn't want to take the embarrassment of there it. Is. Yeah, that's that's the um, <laughs> so the one on the right is the old one. The no, one the... this this isn't uh, this is the um, no, it's a different one. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a um, 
If you type in Dragon Eye, actually, no, let me see. I typed in Dragon Eye Radar. Zach, pull up your search history. You want to pull my search history? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, if you, if you type in Dragon Eye Radar or type 36 Radar, you should be able to feature, you should be able to see it. Dragon Eye Radar type 36 Radar. Uh, 30, uh, 36, uh, 34, 6. 34, 6. You want me to look up pictures? Yeah. You should be able to see it. Yeah, you, you may have to reintroduce the screen to the, uh, the yeah, studio. Yeah, let's do. Stop sharing. Share screen. Uh, just... You talking about this one? Let me see. Yes, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the finished version. Um, I don't know. I don't really see the um, the, the one the before. Initial. Is it this one over here? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Damn it! No, that's a that's a that's a different one. But anyways, yeah, it was just them. It was just a radar dish spitting. It, it was just thinking, you know, mm -hmm. just come out and say that you copied it. Guys. I mean, at this right. point, I mean, like we we all know you did it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's like, don't be so vague, don't be so blunt about, it. don't be is so this, like. Obvious look at this it. ship. Is this paper mache? Why is this like wrinkly and like falling off? Oh, because of the uh, anti radar characteristics or oh, anti radar so it's, material. It's supposed to look like paper mache. Then, all right, cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. aluminum foil. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But yeah, so, I mean, um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sam. No, no. So, um, but yeah. So the the uh, radar, um, it's essentially a copy of the ages, but is it really? Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know. So. More than likely, it's one of those things where the circumstantial evidence is a uh, points in a certain direction. Exactly. Um. As far as production, though, the Chinese are certainly outpacing us, correct? Yep. In terms of ship, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they've, I think they can produce five destroyers a, a year. Right. If not more, if not more. Okay. Uh, compared to like two, two for the United States. That's crazy. In which, yeah, in which that's going to be, if we do get into a fighting war with, with the Chinese, Gonna need them. We're gonna be at us. That matters yeah. big time. Exactly. Exactly. Because do you think we we're could ramp up really though? Take... Do you think that we're at two now because we're being conservative? Do you think that we could ramp it up to five, six, maybe seven? I think it would take some difficulty on our part because we've shut down so many of those boat yards, mm -hmm. those shipyards. From after this Cold War, but. Especially during the war on terror, yeah. So we just we shut them down. It just depends upon how quickly we can get them back up and rolling. So, same question with the the navy. What about the air force? I think with the air force, they're what they're doing right is finally coming to senses that maybe shutting down the F-22 Raptor line is it's not a very vocal or very popular opinion, if I understand, mm -hmm. is that they're coming to terms with the fact that this is a horrible idea. And, that would be good. Yeah. In, in which um, that, and, that and them trying to figure out, that and them trying to make the F-35 do everything yeah, the... to include being an office chair um, <laughs> was nice. also a bad thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't like... see the 35 running CAS. Just can't see that. No. And I think that, and it's a, it's a casualty of the United States institutional dislike. I use that word dislike mm -hmm. um, of them doing CAS because they were settled at that mission since 1947 or eight, I believe mm -hmm. the key West agreement between the army and the air force that enabled the air force to be its own like little mm -hmm. uh, branch. Yep. Um, little. 
Oh, well, right. guys, this now we, little, now we got our I own mean, little branch. <laughs> yeah. <Space branch. laughs> right? Like, like, we have our own child. That's right. <laughs> See? And it's smarter than all of you, and it's smarter. It's a baby. <laughs> right? It's not real. It doesn't but, uh, exist. <laughs> the Space Force can't hurt you. It doesn't exist. It's the Space Force. <laughs> Show me on this doll where the space force hurt you. <laughs> it's right there. It hurt me in space. But no. <laughs> but no, like, um, they have 35. I hope they got it. It seems like they finally figured out the, flow, the, the error in which trying to giving Lockheed Martin, Boeing, whoever mm-hmm. else has that contract, the leadway into mm-hmm. producing the aircraft like actually having the majority of the say of what the aircraft can do mm-hmm. and i think that was a big another big mistake because then now you have it like cost overruns you have these um uh, production delays things such as that because one they have to come back and do the we do the design sometimes mm-hmm. that was the case with the machine with the uh, cannon mm-hmm and then also with the ability to attach hard points, external hard points to the uh, aircraft. Mm-hmm. And that was a big mistake on the Air Force's part, but also DOD, um, since that causes it to go behind, not only behind, but you know, cost overruns to where it's like literally the most expensive defense yeah. program we have in history. Right. And that's including the car- aircraft carriers and also or two and but then not only that but just the fact that the air force is slowly dragging the hills on trying to get a new bomber or at least mm-hmm. to replace the um b1 mm-hmm. and which i don't know if they even have a new one yet or if they gonna re- Oh, they're going to um, rely on the B-21, which if they do that, then that's a significant um, flaw in planning just to be able to say, yeah, we can increase right. these aircraft. Well, it, doesn't um, the 21 have a small, like a significantly smaller payload? Yeah, it's like 30% less payload, but mm-hmm. it's stealthier. I mean, I don't doubt that for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that B1's got, like, two F-16 engines on it. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's not meant to be stealthy. It's meant to no. fuck your ass up. It's like exactly. The, it's like the F-117. It was, like, super cool and built to be awesome. And it it did, mm-hmm. like, one mission where it just blew up Saddam Hussein's palace. And then it wasn't <laughs> flown ever again. <laughs> We're going to use this to just blow your shit up because. <laughs> because we can. Mm-hmm. And we spent money on this. We got we yeah. Well, the F twenty two we were talking about, we we're talking about yesterday, Brandon. The F twenty two's got two aerial kills, and it's balloons. Yeah, this the most advanced like fighter jet, supposed to replace the fifteen, the coolest thing freaking ever. Two balloons. Good job. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but like, who's got the who's got the freaking fighter balls to get in the air with one of those things though? To, That's to true. let it, you know, because whoever does is gonna be blowing up before they even know the F twenty two is there. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's funny because, like, the uh, J-35, not the J-35, but the uh, J-20 has went toe-to-toe with, like, the J- uh, with the F-35. Mm-hmm. They actually flew along it and, you know, flew along, uh, flew around it and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, from my knowledge, I don't think they never done that with the F-22. Should check that. Yeah. Because they have no, because they don't even know if they ever flew next to an F-22. They can't detect it. Mm-hmm. Probably so, but then also... <laughs> like, trying to be as stealth as it could be? Or was it just one of those, like, oh, we don't care. We're just here. It, it's supposed to be stealthy-ish, but it's not, like, supposed to be as stealthy as an F-22. It's like, hey, well, if I... you can fit it into this, into this, go ahead, but... Right. Yeah. Well, I know you're running think... into issues, too, with munitions and stuff like that on the, the 35 and stealth and the, that sort of thing matters for sure, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... That's one thing that, um, that's one thing I, I I see the Air Force hopefully gets back on track with the with the F thirty five. But yeah, I mean, like they've actually seen, I believe the 
an Air Force Corps, or Air Force General mm-hmm. actually said that, hey, we seen we've actually interacted with the J twenty in the East right. China Sea. Right. They have But I haven't heard Yeah, but I haven't heard them saying anything about like the F twenty two. Or at least like the Iranians have with the Air mm-hmm. Force. Right. But then again, I think it's like what Zach said, like <laughs> That's so funny. Uh yeah, like they, they wanted to they wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Because I think if I'm not mistaken, the F four or the F twenty two snuck up on the right. uh, on the phantom. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was. And that, and, that whole thing was the um, the U.S. was flying a drone. Iran shot down a drone. So then the United States Air Force decided, okay, if we have drones flying next to the Iranian border, they're going to be like guarded by F twenty twos because screw it. And so Iran went to intercept this other like just drone. And the F-22s were able to fly underneath the Phantoms, look at their armament, then get up right up next to them and, like, broadcast it to them. Like, you can't, you can't even, like, uh, lock onto us. Like, just leave. And the F-Phantoms, like, immediately, like, like just bounced. They are like, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> but the F-22 was, like, there. Like, right, within, yeah. like, close within plane realms, you know, fighter plane realms. Mm-hmm. Like, right underneath them. And the F the fours had no idea. Um, yeah, a J twenty clashed with an F thirty five in March of twenty twenty two. They flew around each other and they kind of did a couple stuff, and then the J twenty left. Um, but no, I can't find anything where it ever happened with the with the twenty two. But it happened because it's, it's a real spaceship, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to bet. For real, I know it is an X wing. I know the F-22 intercepts like Russian bombers all the time when they go down to like Pacific coast of the U S. Um, but they don't, I don't think, I don't think anyone ever flies next to an F-22. They're too scared. Knowingly. Good. Right. <laughs> no one knowingly <laughs> flies next to an F-22. Right. It's like one of those things in which do you really want to try or do you just want to die? Yeah. So, just real quick, and then we can jump to another topic. But like, where would you say if you had to give just like two points, where the Navy is lacking the most, and then where the, the Air Force is lacking the most in preparedness to go toe to toe with China? I think it would just be their ability to conduct one amphibious operations that the Marine Corps wants to do, mm-hmm. and then two, um, they vastly underestimate their ability to take casualties. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with the Air Force. They think that the technology will be able to save them, but um, things happen. Mm-hmm. Missiles get lucky. The F the F one seventeen that was shot down in Serbia was is a case is a case study in that. Right. So I think for both for both is the fact that they can't they underestimate their ability to take casualties, mm-hmm. and then. I guess with the Air Force too, just them trying to figure out like another lead in through, you know, the A ten. Mm-hmm. Because they need something they need they need something dedicated to CAS, even if it is Island to Island. Yeah. Because um uh, Should we make a stealth A ten? Uh, well see that that's that's my thing, it's the fact <laughs> that, you know, they, they should. I mean it's the I've seen cool cast. renders of it. It looks so sick. Just, just make that. <laughs> exactly. Just do it. Just do it. Just, just do Come on, Raytheon, yeah. you guys. It's just taxpayer money. Come on. Right. So, this is our blood and sweat and tears. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sino, where where do you think the Chinese lack the most in comparison to the Western military in general? Right. Like we talking like NCO core, like where, where, you know, shooting um, qualifications, like where do they fall behind? They fall behind a lot. They've, the NCO core, they want one. They want to create a Western, Western star NCO core. Seems so they, odd. Yeah. It, it's it, when I say Western star style, it will be in the image of what the CCP would want. Mm-hmm the PLA to have. So it's, it's important to bring up that point because the PLA is a party army. Mm-hmm. And before they gave their officers lead way into thinking for themselves, be able to conduct uh, 
not have to listen so much to party directives or party orders. Mm -hmm. But Tiananmen actually caused that caused um, caused that to go away because the CCP understood what could happen. Mm -hmm. Like um, they've um, the uh, commanding general for the garrison in China, uh, in Beijing said at first okay we'll 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 put we'll put down i'll put down the uh i'll put down the uh, protest you know then he drug his feet for a couple of days and then he said like and then ultimately you know he said um shouldn't we be the shouldn't we listen to what the people say like we're the people's liberation army we're the people's liberation mm -hmm. army and so after that um that's whenever you've seen these mass mobilizations of PLA units outside of China, outside of Beijing or in mm -hmm. the surrounding area, just to go in and crush that revolt. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that prior to the most recent reforms in 2015, if not 12, mm -hmm. was that they would, uh, they would, st uh, Chinese people conscripted into the PLA would stay around their home hometowns or home regions mm -hmm. it's not so much now and so okay. that's the reason because of Tiananmen and and so they seen the, they realized that and that's one of the reasons why they actually had to bring people in because they can't they could trust the the garrison units in the, in Beijing to put down the revolt or put mm -hmm. down the uh, protest okay and so for them they want an NCO corps that would be able to lead or you know lead in the last 100 yards if i'm going to use a marine corps terminology go for be it. able to take yeah, to be able to take the initiative be able to utilize the best judgment be able to take the orders of the officer whether it be lieutenant or second lieutenant and mm -hmm. go forward they want that but they don't want it to be they don't want the ncos to have too much power the same thing with That's the officers it is. It is. But for them, they think they can do it. They've we actually seen them trying to implement it. But will it work? Time will tell until time will tell if it, they truly are able to implement it with the ultimate test being the crucible of war. I just want to say real quick for the layman listening, because this conversation, this specifically, right? If you're in the military or have been in the military, you'll understand what we're talking about. We're talking about NCO and why it's so important. Um, and I've been around a lot of our NATO partners and the United States having the NCO Corps and the rank structure that it does is, is unique in a lot of ways. Even to some of our NATO partners, they don't have that. They have a lot of conscripts. Um, they have a lot of, uh, you know, the ranks aren't as spread apart. And um, the reason why that's so important is because at the end of the day, Zach and I, you and I were talking about this yesterday, that if if we're all in a platoon and this person who's our leader goes down, right, we all know who's next in charge. And that person should know the job of the person over them, just like the person mm -hmm. under them knows the job of the person over them. And it goes down all the way to the lowest ranking person. And that's crucial because if we all understand the the mission set, we all understand what we have to do. We get to, you know, whatever, there's a frangible wall. We have to go in this way. We know we have, you know, how we're going to breach or how, what, what objective we're going to. I understand as, you know, let's say an E4, I understand what the O2's mission set is. If he goes down, my, you know, sergeant goes down, I now am in command. I know I can still get there because I know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is unique to a smaller group of Western militaries. The United States leads the way absolutely in the NCO course, the most important piece of our military. And so for the Chinese to want to have this, it, it shows that they know that it's a good thing and that it works. But like you said, Zach, it's counterproductive. You have to it have goes something called their thought process. It does. Like, and you have to have something called decentralized command in mm -hmm. order to have that. When the corporal can lead the way from point A to point B, when, you know, his sergeant and the LT in charge go down, that's decentralized command. He's making decisions for himself and the people around him. And, you know, you have to be able to let go of those reins a little bit, which, like you said, Zach, is counterproductive. Yeah, like they've. 
they understand the ultimate the the CCP, which is ultimately what controls the PLA. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have the P, the PLA doesn't have its own is not its own entity as the U.S. Army or you know the British Army or you know the French Army. Mm-hmm. It's a party army. It's subordinate and will always follow the directives, or at least the CCP hopes uh, follow the directives of it, of the party. And so for them to lose, to see that control means to see the control of the barrel of the gun. Mm-hmm. Because that's one of the main power, main pillars of power the CCP has to maintain control. As you've seen, as we've seen in Tinnaman, Yes, the people are complaining about power, even though the even though the CCP is supposed to be for the people. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we don't they don't really care for what the people want as long as they have the guns. Yeah, to you know enforce their will. Well, that's what I was getting at when you're saying it's counterproductive to to allow your lower enlisted um, to have the ability to lead. Then they have to have more knowledge about things going on. And if they have the knowledge yeah. of things going yes. on, then they're probably going to rise up and overthrow you. So you can't. <laughs> it's yeah. like a, yeah. no, no, no. I, I want them to know things to help me win this war. But if they know things, they're going to be on the other side of me fighting me in this war. <laughs> that's do you bring up a good point, Zach? Is because like they've that's also another reason why they looked into AI so much, especially for operational decision making, but also intelligence. Mm. That makes sense. And so we have AI yeah, make the so decisions, that, but it has like a stop. Like you can you can lead them until you want to overthrow me. Once you overthrow me, you can no longer lead them. <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 that it's it's that one. It's that aspect. But then also the fact that you brought it up too is like if we don't give them critical thinking skills or like the ability to think for themselves, mm-hmm. but we let the AI do it, then we don't have to deal with that issue, right? Because at the end of the day, these those AI programs like War Skull and War Skull Two, they mm-hmm. have a built-in mechanism to where uh, the you uh, where the both programs would supply the decisions to the uh, to the commander. Mm-hmm. Now he's able to pick, but he's only be able to pick between his options A, B, and C or D. Mm-hmm. And he and if he tries to deviate from that, it won't let them. Mm. It's pretty limiting. <laughs> it's like false options. <laughs> kind of. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, P- the PLA said that, at least the scientists behind the programs that are being used now, they said that it could be, um, it could take into consideration tactical and operational changes on the battlefield, but I don't see that happening. Mm. At least not as fast as like as we would do it as the United States military could do it mm-hmm. because, you know, our leaders trust us. Right. I feel like that's such a nuance because who's inputting the data? How is it receiving the data? Like are the data points on like the soldiers or are they on like, cause yeah. I feel like, so it, I feel like in war, like that's why the, that's why the Lance corporal can make such a split second decision. that's going to like win that battle in that moment or, you know, whatever. And the time it would take for the data points to get to, the, I know AI and computers are fast, but still the data has to get there, then be analyzed, mm-hmm. then decided upon, and then sent back. And that and there's time, no human element in it either. Yeah. In, mm-hmm. in that time it took the, that Chinese military to figure that out, the freaking Marine corporal who's three bangs in and high off freaking nicotine has already wiped out half your forces. Like he's moving on to the next. <laughs> He's hacking your AI and using it to look up pornographic material. Like he's not, <laughs> he's moved on. Off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So th- that's another thing is the fact that, um, they're, they, um, everyone's a sensor. Or yeah, at least right. the Every air was a sentry. Exactly. <laughs> um, you're, sure. um, they'll be able to upload anything. The, the AI program is able to use anything from like the new, um, the new um, headsets that the PLA um, is rolling out, all the way up to information from national level asset or you know satellites, um, surveillance drones, things such as that. Be able to take that information and 
combine it and analyze it. Are these like squad time. level headsets? Um, no, they're. I forgot the one that's um, that the U.S. Army's and the I think the U.S. Marine Corps is running out. Mm. It's the same. It's the same lines. It's okay. the same. It's the same thing. Got you. They they copied it. Um, again. So Weird. it's like. There's, there's a recurring theme about this is that certain <laughs> yeah. technologies that um you could tell which uh, which technologies are important to the chinese by is how much copy they copied it? it yeah <laughs> and to what degree to copy it maybe it's the same thing it. yeah yeah no I, I agree but no it's that's one of the things about it is the fact that you know for the nco core it's that decentralized command and ability to you figure it out, you take the lead. They want that, but only to a certain extent mm -hmm. because they know what that leads to. Right. Trying to prevent things from happening. Mm -hmm. So obviously to win wars, you have to uh, put bullets down range. And I know that um, you and I were talking offline about this, but the standards for qualification are apparently significantly different between the United States and the Chinese. And it sounds like the Chinese are uh, not definitely not up to snuff. No, um, especially now since they've quote unquote uh, revamped it. Okay. They just added in, they just added in, they just added in 200 yards, uh, 200, uh, 200 yards, uh, 200 meters uh, qualification distance. And you, they're able to shoot and, and uh, expanded the uh, positions they could use. Okay. And that's flies. That's totally opposite to what the Marine Corps and, and army d does now, which mm -hmm. is totally focused upon combat, focus upon how to shoot a moving target and disassociative terrain. Mm -hmm. um, you have to run, run, run a certain distance and then acquire the target and shoot it. And then um, I believe for the case of the Marine Corps, they're able to use like plywood cutouts or plywood uh, decks that simulate door frames and things such as that. Mm -hmm. So it's more along the lines of we're trying to replicate combat, uh, what you things that you uh, instances or situations that you would have to that you have to that you find yourself shooting at uh, shooting in in combat, in actual combat. Okay. Whereas, and I know I totally butchered that, and yeah. I know. But um, uh, but when you compare that to the PLAs, which is essentially a downgraded table two mm -hmm. for the Marine Corps, just static shooting, right? It just flies in the face. I even saw they have like uh, simulated shooting ranges. Mm -hmm. I think that's also. I think that's the reason why they've also don't really put an emphasis on actually shooting as well. Um, because they do have those, because they do have those simulate simulations, but it's more along the lines of CQB, right? Uh, you okay. be able to do like CQBs, be able to um, operate in buildings, rooms, clear mm -hmm. out how to clear out rooms. Yeah, they also yeah. don't have a and, lot of ammo. Like they do have, they have a lot of ammo, yes, but like they don't have a lot of ammo to spare practicing, right? They're like worried that if something ever happened. That ammo needs to be used on the battlefield, not to practice for the battlefield. So they withhold a lot of training ammo. I remember reading that. Yeah, so they, on the on average, the PL, a PLA soldier shoots around 160 ra uh, rounds per year. Okay. Um, That's wild, because you shoot more than 160 rounds in one day, typically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they, they give you a comparison... Long. 160 rounds would be the United uh, would be the Marines' new quali pre qualification. Yeah. On what's average, like, what's the Marine Corps' qual? Is it like quarterly? Is it biannually? Like what is it? It's annually. It's annually. Okay. It's it's annually for everyone, but you have to understand people in combat and more or yeah. in but, units yeah. who. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. So, the the. MOS is, you know, your Army 11 Bravos, Marine Infantry, like those guys are throwing live range or uh, live rounds down range all the time. They're shooting thousands mm -hmm. of right. rounds a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes a difference. Yeah. So to see, exactly. To see, so to see the PLA shooting that many rounds or shooting the number of rounds and then 
expect them to be as good as it is compared to the United States or the United States Army Marine Corps is kind of laughable. Definitely. So I'll ask you a couple more questions and we can uh, kind of wrap it up. But one of the things I'm interested in is where where do you see American soft versus Chinese soft? And by soft, I mean Special Operations Forces, anybody listening, falling into the equation should something go hot? I think it would be just them doing clandestine operations behind enemy lines. They would be able to do those, you know, be able to do deep reconnaissance, be able to do deep sabotage missions. Mm-hmm. Thanks this is that. Blowing up like and, power power supply areas, like dams, messing with communications, that type of stuff. Yeah, but I think the uh, but I think the um certain elements of the CIA would deal with blowing up dams because it would look bad upon us and it goes against the oh, law. Yeah. Or... It, it would be the rise up of the Chinese people, mm-hmm. CIA assets, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, um, but yeah, it'd be like, the, so for, so I'm going to break it down by like soft unit, I guess. Break That's it down. what to do. So Green Beret. Yeah. So Green Beret would be those units doing a combination of, of deep strike, maybe deep reconnaissance, because they can't do integral defense, uh, integral defense because it's China. They mm-hmm. could, but it would take time for them to actually grow something out of nothing. Not only that, but their time is better spent on like doing kinetic type of missions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sabotage, deep reconnaissance, things like that. And then, so Navy SEALs would be going in, doing reconnaissance on beachheads, beach landing sites, things such as that. Same thing with Force Recon. Maybe Marine Corps, um, the Marine Raiders would be, would be the middle link between the Green Berets and Navy SEALs since they can do both. Right. And then the PJs would be doing uh, rescue operations for any down aircraft or any down airmen mm-hmm. trying to locate them. And then uh, TACP would just be doing TACP things. Combat control, TACP, yeah. Just blowing, the, yeah. blowing shit up. Exactly. Oh, and man. then for the weathermen, the special operations weathermen, they'll tell the weather. Now, so the Air Force actually, they don't call them combat weather anymore. What do they call them? Special recon. And they definitely, they kind of changed up their mission set quite a bit. Mm. Um, shout out One's Ready Podcast. Uh, but uh, <laughs> they have a, a special recon um, operator on their uh, their podcast. Uh, so I would, uh, I'll hit you up offline with uh, his name and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely changed up. And the Air Force is kind of geared, gearing itself to be a little bit more ready by changing the mission set. Okay. Yeah, that's good because I always thought that was strange because why would you need, why would this be considered soft, like special operations? You literally just tell the weather. Well, they definitely, I'll say this, they definitely do a lot more than the weather. And obviously when you're dealing with aircraft, um, the weather is very important. Specifically at A-10, doing low yeah. strike stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean... I, like, I'm not going to pretend like I know everything about what Southie used to do when they were called Southie, but, um, you know, the, they definitely changed up their mission set quite a bit. Um, but, uh, I know you can learn a lot about it from the ones ready podcast. They talk about it a lot. And, um, the guy that is uh, on there, he's actually the career field of functional. So he is, uh, like the guy up there. Yeah. The <laughs> dude. Oh. oh, wow. So mm-hmm. he's, so he's been in it for, Quite a, quite a while. Yeah, he's a he's a senior NCO. He's up there. Um, really, really funny. We've had him on before. Tr- Trent Siegmiller is his name. I mean, it's not like you can't find him. Uh, but he's he's hilarious. He's awesome. Really, really down to earth guy. Um, but uh, yeah, he uh, 
he could tell us a lot more about it if he was here. And I'm sure I sent him a a, a video the other day, and it was a, it was of a, like an F4 tornado, like somewhere and i was like so so when this thing's coming at you guys i was like do you guys just like aim the 240 like right at the base or what you know and he, he took it i know exactly i was like he, he he knew exactly what i was saying but it just it, it cracked me up probably more than it cracked him up you know what i mean but yeah it just they don't they, yeah it's it's uh i think it's a very misunderstood career field and i think a lot of the air force um special operations guys are very misunderstood i think pjs obviously they're the, like the most well-known of the air force uh special operations guys um combat controllers I mean, we've we talked about we've had combat controllers on our podcast um and we even talked to um one of our episodes with dan Schilling. he uh pretty put it put it pretty pretty well when he said that the most lethal warrior to ever walk the, the planet uh just because they literally hold the firepower of the u.s air force at their fingertips um so i mean they uh you know the air force doesn't doesn't go as noticed as like you know the the green berets or the seals for sure um it's by design, but though. it is by design. the air force tries to keep it say. pretty quiet like if you're in you're in if you're in the know you're in the know if you're mm-hmm. not then go to sleep don't worry about it go to sleep stand yeah. post go to the gate yep <laughs> But yeah, you got so, that picture uh, of that Stealth A-10, dude? I do. I do. But I'm a, that's going to be the end. That's the end of this podcast. For everyone listening, you got to watch all the way to the end or skip, I guess. I, to the I end, like it. Because you, you can do that. Make, make them stay on. <laughs> <laughs> make them stay on. Like but, right. I had dude. I had one more final question uh, for you, Senna. Um, small tactical yield nukes. Now, there's like Russia's threatened to use them in Ukraine, so like that. Do you think in a conflict with like China that that's something that could be realistically used? I don't think so. No, I don't think China would use them. They're not. They we're, wouldn't because we're talking about like they, they wouldn't do it if they want to remove like a, a carry strike group. A carry strike group, like you're not going to sink the ship. It's still going to be there. But you can vaporize all the sailors. Yeah, but I think the calculus for them to even use nuclear war, they're on the verge of defeat. Mm-hmm. The CCP, the CCP would feel as if du- nuking American troops would be worth the risk of any potential retaliation from the United States because we'll, we'll retaliate with nuclear weapons on our own. Oh yeah. Now, if, now, Mad. would it be? Will, <laughs> will it be tactical nukes? Maybe if we're able to move them from their bases, but I think we'll be at that point. At that point, I think the United States president would be willing to turn the key. Mm-hmm. Any minute, that, full on continental ballistic nuke. Yeah, or the, or the very least, <laughs> get or the very least authorize the movement of land attack cruise missiles with that capability. Or the submarines that we don't know where they're at just all of a sudden start launching nukes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you don't got to go to work tomorrow, guys. It's over. <laughs> exactly. We're all dead. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> but a country that would actually use nuclear weapons in the Asia Pacific would be North Korea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's crazy now, uncle. What's, what's funny is mm-hmm. I feel like North Korea, if like something broke out, North Korea would be like, China. Like, let me in. Like, I can help you. Like, we can do this. And China be like, no, stop. Like, knock it off. And then North Korea, like, nukes Beijing. Whoops. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> They would be doing a massive favor. <laughs> right? It's like, oh. We, are we, we the baddie? We aimed it for <laughs> right? Seoul, and it just went a little further. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's so sorry. We didn't mean, like, you should have gave us GPS uh Right. You know GPS systems. You we know we're not them. good at this. <laughs> we just pointed and shot. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's, like those little, it's like a child <laughs> pump rocket where you like just press on and it goes into the air. <laughs> just thinking of like a, a fucked up mortar round. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Right. We you know what we hmm. is if you know, and if North Korea ever does that, let's just say they they want they see t- uh, the China and the United States get into an actual armed conflict. Yeah. I always wanted to know 
Uh, would they actually? Would they actually? That is why. Why don't we have that? Exactly. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> it's so cool. It messed up your train of thought. Like right. This the right wild here, wolf. This needs to be a thing. Not, the name could not be that. I mean, like no, it doesn't. Yeah. Even, come up it doesn't even be the wild wolf. It needs to be like the the A fourteen like super warthog or something. Super like, warthog. Yeah. Right. Goss goss but, hog. I don't know. <laughs> something but anyways like i i'm I'm hoping that you know if that if that ever happens then we have some ingenious people in somewhere that would give the north koreans the wrong coordinates or be able to like <laughs> mess around with the coordinates on the missile so that whenever it does launch it's like it's not going it's not going down guys it's, it's not going south turn. guys yeah it goes up right yeah <laughs> this keeps going <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! Yeah, like, sir, is we, this we get closer, sir? We put in Korea, and the missile doesn't know north or south, so it just came right back. It went to the one true Korea. <laughs> yeah, it went to. It knows that we're Korea, so it just came back. <laughs> right, it's a, it knows his homeland. <laughs> All right, so now I got I got two two last questions for you, for me at least. Um, mm -hmm. What to? And they're they're not really related, but what is <laughs> what's China's biggest Achilles heel? And then do you think China will actually invade Taiwan? Mm. Spicy one than that extra spicy one. That's right. Mm -hmm. Coco's level ten. I, right? I Coco's <laughs> twenty. <laughs> I'll I'll um uh, I'll answer the uh biggest Achilles heels one okay. um first be quick about this. I think the biggest one is the lack of their ability to, the lack of their fighting a war. The mm -hmm. last time they fought a war, China fought a war was in 1970s, 1979. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese know that it's a weakness for them because they don't know how well to be able to act under that type of pressure. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but um, their troops would act. Because there have been reports of their um, UN the contingents fighting quote unquote in africa yeah it's part of the un but that's just them shooting like three to four bullets and running away yeah so doesn't they, count as yeah, exactly as much as they like to um use those type of un missions as an analog to get combat experience it's not really working out for them mm -hmm. another achilles hill would be this their ability to conduct logistical operations okay um sustaining logistical operations they can't really do it um and then just their command and control they know they have to conduct a joint operation mm -hmm. but they can't really do it they haven't really done anything they haven't really successfully conducted a an exercise bigger than a bigger than a division okay and even at the division level there were still some hiccups. So for them, so I think for them would be logistical, their C2, and then also they never fought a war in like two or three generations at this point. So it's like, how can they act under pressure? Regarding okay. joint, regarding um, command and control, they're still trying to figure it out. So there's that other added right. issue. That's going to be a hard and, one for them, especially if they don't, you know, have an NCO core. They do. They're exactly. going to have the AI core. AI core, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Artificial Intelligence Commissioned Officer Core. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then the other one, I think I talked to you about this, Brandon, mm -hmm. um, about the potential for Taiwan. Yeah. And be invaded. I don't think it's what happened. I like it. It will take a lot of issue. It will take a lot for China to even invade Taiwan mm -hmm. because the biggest Achilles heels for China, for the PLA in general, are the ones that would inherit it the most during an invasion. And a lot of people don't get that. They would rather focus upon the cessationalism. Oh, well, Taiwan, they said, you know, she said uh, for the PLA to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. It's like, Relaxed, he said, just to be ready, not to that they will invade. Right, just totally different, totally different things. And not only that, but just the fact that China has better ways of doing of 
taking over Taiwan. The um, uh, non kinetic, more mm -hmm. specifically, they would rather take it take it without firing a shot. And again, this is going back to those um, back to the Achilles Hill, but then also the fact that they don't. They never really had a tradition of fighting a war to take over people's land, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Like they've always, they've always utilized centrifuge, um, causing the people to up, to rise up against them, to, uh, to make it e to either flip the country towards them or make it easier for them to invade, to capture right. the country. And so you kind of, so this is where Sung Zeus Art of War comes in because that's essentially, if you read it, it's, it's about him winning, it's about him winning a war against three opponents mm -hmm. without really fighting a battle. Mm -hmm. That's how China act, kind of sees the PLA, like we want, or themselves. They want to be able to win, uh, they want to be able to win Taiwan without firing a shot. Right. And they're going to utilize political, economic, diplomatic to try that. To, to try that, right? With war being the last option, literally the last option. Got you. Uh, you know, and then go oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, uh, you may you, you may actually uh, you may actually ask this question or talk about this. <laughs> so go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say that, um, and if I'm not talking about what you were going to say, make sure you hit it. But that that's a, it is, you said it was a spicy, spicy take um, because it is, it's the unpopular opinion right now that it'll happen. You had uh, air mobility commands commander, General Minahan come out and put this big memo out about when it's going to happen and aim for the head and all this stuff. And, you know, every airman's got to fire all these rounds, you know, now. And um, it's definitely the unpopular opinion. And I think it's unpopular opinion for a couple of reasons. And I think the, the, in the consensus is that it's going to happen because it drives, um, you know, readiness and it drives that importance home for people in, in the military. But um, I like that you take the other side of the coin because that's not the one that you hear most often. And it is something when Zach and I have these conversations or I think about it like on my own, like, do I really think that's going to happen? Um, you know, part of me feels a bigger part of me feels like, no, um, I would say that I lean in a more in the camp of, yes, it will happen, um, but maybe not in the way that people um, think it think it is going to. Um, but I do. I like that you take the other side of that because it's it's a side not heard often and it's good to hear all these sides. But go ahead. Say what you were going to say. I don't know if I hit it. No, like, no, uh, no. Uh, I was going to also touch upon like the likelihood of it succeeding because mm -hmm. that's also an important thing because Definitely. we can talk about like, oh, they're going to do it, but it's right. actually going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I don't, I think a lot of people don't like to talk about because then it kind of blows up in their face. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, logistical issues being the biggest list, uh, Achilles Hill and for China, that's specifically force projection, sustained extraditionary logistics mm -hmm. because they want to, be like the United States. Now, what that means is that they'll be able to sustain any amphibious operation or any movement inland. They can't really do that, mm -hmm. at least not right now, without using massive amounts of amphibious, uh, um, without using massive amounts of civilian shipping. Okay. In which we've seen them doing it. We've seen them actually conducting practice amphibious landings using, you know, roll on roll off ships, civilian roll on roll off ships in the first wave, if mm -hmm. not subsequent ones. Right. So we see them doing this. And then not only that, but just the mere fact that any, um, they may not have enough amphibious capability to transport all six of their brigades, mm -hmm. amphibious mechanized brigades. And and the planned Marine Corps, if they ever get trained up on how to do amphibious operations, mm -hmm. they they be able to utilize all all twelve branches, I believe, or mm -hmm. all twelve brigades at once. So they're going to have to utilize amphibious. Uh, they're going to have to utilize one level of ships to at least transport them and or launch them. Mm -hmm. 
and then another thing is just going back to C two. Like they've don't they can't they can't operate in a joint joint environment. In which again, going back to AI, they kind of hope that AI can help them do it. But mm -hmm. if you can't really operate by yourselves in a joint environment, adding in another layer of complexity such as AI will not help. That's a good point. It's like throwing monkey wrenches into this into this plan, and then not only that. Speaking of joint uh, command and control, the there is a hundred percent degree of likelihood that uh, whoever is commanding the eastern, whoever is commanding the invasion, will have to answer to a political commissar mm. sent directly from Beijing or a party official sent directly from Beijing to make sure he doesn't screw up, in which. Um, that official will have the ability to add in monkey wrenches, aka mm -hmm. the good idea fairy. He will be the good. He will be the physical incarnation of the good idea fairy. At this point, I love it. Yeah, and so he'll throw in all these great ideas. Yeah, if we do this, we'll be able to win. And like he's like, okay, I can't really do that. Mm -hmm. You have to because I said so. It's like, but okay. Right. Throw the monkey like throw the monkey wrench, and then it's just like. It's just like politics getting in the way of Vietnam comes to exactly, mind. but exactly, but um, with Vietnam, you didn't have the you wouldn't have the immense pressure felt by the officials on the operational mm. level, like it would be like like the like that one general would feel, right? And which, to be honest with you, I kind of feel sorry for him because he's going to be feeling. He's, his back is going to be against a wall. Mm -hmm. And when he and, fails, he's going to die. Right. Pretty much. Like, it, it's like setting him, it, it would be like she is setting him up for failure, even if he, even though he's not. Mm -hmm. Because what, it's adding in that. What's interesting about right? that is if she, if they know he's setting up for failure, do you think she's going to put his best general in there? No, um, un like undoubtedly, but it would be, but undoubtedly, but it would be a general who you can trust. Yeah, it'll be one he trust, but he's not going to be the best because when he when he fails, then he, he's going to you know be the laughing stock of the of the party. He's going to be probably killed, you know, all type of stuff. And then she's going to need an actual general to help him when the retaliation shows up. You're considering that the PLA or the CCP even still exists at that point. True. Yeah. So I mean, this, I this like is that. another thing. This is another cool thing about the potential uh, potential for it to fail. It's because the Chinese Communist Party put so much emphasis, or they moved from guaranteeing economic prosperity to people mm -hmm. to one that is more based upon nationalism. That, like Pierre Han said. At the end of the day, you may not be getting rich. You may not be, you know, may not live the best life, but at least you wake up and be a Han. You mm -hmm. can be proud of that. Yeah. But, you know, you failing at taking over Taiwan, something that will rejuvenate China to make it whole again, quote unquote, is a failure. Right. That would anger, and that would anger a lot of people to the point to where they will protest. It will cause a lot of social stability, instability. Mm -hmm. And something that China that that the party does not like, and that will that would have the potential to cause a revolution. That'd be interesting. Yeah, it would be, and granted, I I hope it wouldn't. I hope it wouldn't turn out like that. But and the reason why is because nukes and them being out in the wild and. Those potential and the potential for them to fall into uh, actors. Not only that, but just the lot of way equipment that the PLA has just would be up for sale at that point. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things in which. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't care if the PLA. I mean, I, I care if they fall. I mm -hmm. want to, but I hope it's like, I hope the party does it. It, it falls in such a way it won't cause mass. Yeah. As massive as an impact as it would be. I otherwise. care for the innocents in China. Yeah, who civilian don't have populace. A, who don't have a choice in the matter. Who would definitely mm -hmm. feel the effects. I've, I've said something yeah. similar when like, it comes to like 
the war with uh, China potentially is that I hope that the U S if there is a conflict and we're like fully intertwined in it, that they don't like over invest into it. If, if that makes sense, like there's no need for us to invade China. There's no need for us to like hold any ground. There's no, like realistically, if you wanted to win it, all you got to do is just knock them from the ability to do anything anymore in that region and then just kind of let them crumble on their own. So I would hope that if the U.S. does get intervened, it'd be kind of like when we invaded I when we invaded Iraq, we annihilated their entire government and their military in like a week. And then we should just left. Like we didn't need to like stay in there and build up. You know, is that right? So like I'm I'm. Hoping I get what you're trying to say. I, yeah, I yeah. think the United States gets more. This is just my opinion. If China tries to invade Taiwan, they fail, right? Through the defense of the Taiwanese and then the United States' involvement, right? Yeah. I think the U.S. gets way more invasive with the Chinese mainland. And I don't necessarily mean like some sort of occupation, but I think, you know, we're talking about an American in Beijing, Americans in Beijing saying, this is what the fuck's going on. And this is what's yeah, going to happen. What I mean. Yeah. I, we don't need like military. We don't need like Abrams driving through like China. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you can slap them down pretty hard and then just in a way politically can just, just like fix it almost kind of like what we did after world war two with Japan. Like we didn't have like full on yep. like brigades walking down mainland Japan. Like it wasn't a thing, but we, but we curtailed what? them to, hey, this is what you're going to be now. And yeah. if you what keep do you think, acting though? up, we're going to slap you again. See, I don't think that would happen. I, because personally, that would cause the CCP to regain some power. Mm -hmm. Because their whole notion is that, you know, they're trying to rejuvenate the Chinese, China. And for us to become an act like an occupy, occupying power, like in the 18th, 18th century, that would probably put more emphasis, that would probably drive the population back towards the mm -hmm. CCP, or at the very least become hostile towards us. Yeah. And at that point, we would have to ask, like, is it worth it? But what we, I think where the emphasis we would, we would place on is, you know, covert operations, like those mm -hmm. influence operations, sending in people like, like the OSS, like the OSS, OSS did and um then we were to mm -hmm. go behind the lines doing as doing as best as we can muck it up not only that but be able to just to, um just to influence people to not follow the ccp but mm -hmm. uh oh throw the ccp just psyop all day exactly and sabotage psyop and sabotage call up rick prado get him on it hell yeah <laughs> This, you know, this is a uh, honestly uh, a fantastic conversation, man. One of the longest ones we've had, and I appreciate you sitting through almost three hours with us doing this um, because I, I know I've learned We're a lot boring. and I've loved listening. Yeah, oh, totally not. <laughs> uh, I, I've loved listening to you, man, because you've taught me a lot, and I like having these sorts of conversations. Because as Zach said earlier, this is an aim of ours: is to put this information out there so people understand seriousness of the situation, disabuse some of the misinformation, and then understand what the playing field really looks like. And I think that you did a really good job, um, you know, giving your opinion and, and backing up logically and, and all of that. And I appreciate you doing that. And there's a lot of good information here for, you know, people who are, I think there's a lot more than you'd realize, but people who want to sit through three hours worth of a podcast. I know um, there's a ton of great info, man. So I appreciate you coming on and doing that with us. Uh, thank you. I mean, that's actually something that I actually one of the reasons why I t started Cine Talk is because, you know, I've seen people post stuff that doesn't necessarily is true about China and then also the cessationalism. Mm -hmm. So I kind of figured, you know, I could do this, not only put uh, put out information about China, but then also put a spotlight to, you know, some of the more nefarious activities that China does, especially mm -hmm. to its uh, minorities, religious minorities and ethnic minorities. And so that's one of the big things that I, uh, one of the goals of this, of my, uh, of my, uh, of my, uh, of my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. Dude, pl plug where people can find you, man, your Substack, Instagram, all that. So um, they can go and 
uh, support you, find out more information, and you you post regularly the publications that you're on, your own Substack, all this stuff. Plug yourself, man. Yeah, so yeah, so I have a, a Instagram account, a Substack, Cinotalk. You can cr- literally find it on both by Cinotalk. Um, in addition to that side endeavor, I also have another. I'm also the Asia Pacific or a- Indo Pac chief for the Bulletin on the Borderlands, where I write not only about China, but uh, topics about the uh, Asia Pacific, where, you know, from my opinion, the war fighters who subscribe or are able to read this should, should know about. Mm-hmm. And it's not always focused upon China. It's focused upon um, India and its ability uh, and its abilities, capabilities, um, the loitering drones and how they've seen a massive increase in mm-hmm. China, uh, Taiwan and, and India uh, and India, and then also the Solomon islands and why those islands are so important right. because it's not as if you fought a battle, they'll have fought a battle they uh, there in World War two. Mm-hmm. So sweet, man. Um, you know, I, I appreciate, like I said, I subscribed to you on Substack. Honestly, went through a ton of your stuff. It's awesome. Uh, I know if uh, our listeners are interested in listening to to us, then they'll definitely find value in your Substack and your page. Um, so go check out uh, Sino Talk stuff um, again, man. Really, really appreciate you coming on. Um, don't forget to stay on with us uh, after we end. And then, um, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you both to Brand. Uh, thank you both, Brandon and Zach. To- for inviting me on. Absolutely, man. You have a good night. You as well. What's going on, Fire fans? I Came With Fire podcast is sponsored by Red Clover Coffee and Sheep's Clothing, LLC. Red Clover Coffee is a veteran-owned company with small batch roasted coffees, and they just happen to donate to some pretty awesome charities. Whether you're into specialty flavored coffees, single source coffees, or having a really cool coffee mug and some badass slaps, Red Clover has you covered. You can order ground, whole bean or even coffee pods and get it all at 10 percent off your entire purchase using coupon code came with fire again that's 10 percent off your entire purchase using our coupon code came with fire i personally love their blueberry invasion and african roast that blueberry invasion hits the spot head over and get yourself some awesome coffee and support us by supporting our sponsor i came with fire podcast is also sponsored by sheep's clothing llc Sheep's Clothing LLC is a unifying banner for all violent arts, disciplines, professions, and survivors of violent circumstances. Redefine violence. Both Zach and I being survivors of violent circumstances and LEOs in the military, we are especially excited to be able to offer you 10% off your entire purchase with coupon code FIRE10 at checkout. Whether you're looking for an awesome t-shirt, hats, slaps, flags, or MMA gear, they've got you covered. Me personally, I love my snapback with the leather patch surrounded by God's flannel. If you know, you know. That's coupon code FIRE10, F-I-R-E-1-0 at checkout for 10% off your entire purchase. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. And if you should feel compelled, treat yourself by supporting our sponsors as well. They truly make a difference for us. Now let's make a difference for them. See you on the next show.